seven, six, five. Good evening. Um, my name is uh, Ivan Stelkovic and I'm speaking on behalf of Kingston Peace Council tonight. Thank you all for coming out. I know it's not easy to go against the grain, to go against the overwhelming mainstream consensus for war and imperialism. It's hard to be a peace activist in the belly of the beast. People are under enormous pressure not to associate with these kinds of events. People are risking and losing their jobs over being associated with these kinds of events. Events. I say we're in the belly of the beast, even though we're in Canada, not USA, which is the beast. It's good because Canada is very similar to USA uh, and has at no point in its history wavered on its commitment to empire, first as a British settler colony, then as a junior partner in the British colonial empire, and then at around the time of the Second World War, transitioning into becoming a junior partner of the American empire, which is the biggest war machine known to humans. It is not an accident that people putting this, this show on are like myself, members of nations and communities who have been victims of these empires. Or I really should say not always victims of empires, but at times successful resistance, resistors of these empires. I come from Yugoslavia, which was a country that officially led an online movement that opposed block politics and imperialist alliances, such as NATO. Neighboring Greece, where Dimitris parents are from, also has a long history of resisting imperialism. In fact, it was Yugoslavia that helped Greek partisans continue to resist having their country become a part of NATO alliance for many years after the Second World War, and, uh, and it was supposed to fall into the hands of Americans. It eventually did succumb to a right-wing dictatorship and became an ally of USA and a member of NATO. But the Greeks never fully surrendered, and in the latest elections, anti-imperialist forces destroying strong in decades. In Greece and in former Yugoslavia, an anti-imperialist position is certainly not as unusual as it is here in the belly of the beast. What made Yugoslavia's non-alignment is Greece's, Greece's ability to resist becoming a part of this military alliance for so long uh, possible is the geopolitical situation at the time, namely the existence of a strong anti-imperialist superpower in, uh, in Soviet Union. Whatever we may think of Soviet Union internally, of the way its socialism in one country functioned, there is no doubt that its very presence, let alone actual material and diplomatic support for nations which chose to chart a different path of development than the one prescribed by USA and its Western imperialist allies, had a huge impact. There would be no non-alignment or such quick and radical decolonization of the conquered third world nations without USSR, just like there would be no post-war prosperity in the West either, whereby corporations were taxed at 91% rate and everyone could afford to own a home and a car. Paradoxically, paradoxically there would be no Trumps make America great again without USSR. Of course, Russia today is no USSR, but it does have one thing in common with USSR, and that's the fact that it is standing in the way of a total world domination by the USA-led alliance. I am here in Canada because I come from a country that stood in the way of that alliance. And we, as well as Russia and China, who wanted to help, were too weak at a time to be able to. It is important to recognize them, both our weaknesses and our strengths, our defeats and victories, and it is certainly a victory of sorts to see there is a new anti-imperialist alliance being built, and I'm proud and excited to be a part of it. Still, the job is far from done, and the enemy is in many ways stronger than ever. NATO has never been bigger, and military budgets with imperialist powers are as large as ever. And we in Kingston feel like within Canada, we are in the belly of the beast, surrounded as we are by seven prisons, Canada's only military college, a military base, and an extremely conservative post-secondary institution called Queen's University, the proud home of No Means Yes campaign, and the closest thing we have to American Ivy League schools in Canada. That's our excuse for the fact that we are a small organization, but we've put on some big shows. We've hosted Eve Zangler, then Kovalik, and we've organized protests against this war and against the military spending. Fighting for peace is not just about peace in abstract, but also about creating conditions for peaceful development of all. It's about spending on healthcare and education, 
housing and creating good jobs in the sectors of the economy that don't destroy the planet. It's hard to get through the media blockade. Please help us, Kingston Peace Council, offset costs of this very expensive tour and help us be able to put on events like this in the future. Follow our Facebook page, reach out to us via email to get involved in our group and please donate generously to our GoFundMe. Chat function will be enabled at the end of Dimitri's presentation. Click the CC Live Transcript button on your Zoom control panel if you'd like to view captions. Please keep in mind that this is an automatic transcription by robots, not humans, so it will include errors. Please use Q&A function to pose your questions. If you don't mind, please identify yourself personally and mention your political group or group affiliation. Um, the, the question in a uh, box will uh, be questions that, that will reach Dimitri and he will read them uh, later and you can start writing at any time. And now I will turn this over to Ken Stone uh, of the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War and a member of the organization, uh, a member of, which is a member of the organization of the Canada Wide Peace and Justice. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, on behalf of the Canada-wide Peace and Justice Network, I'd like to welcome everyone to this webinar, planned as a forum for Dimitri to report back to Canadians on his mission of peace to Russia in April of this year. The network was pleased to organize the 13-city Canada-wide lecture tour, for which this free webinar was intended to be the culminating event. In many of those cities, a concerted campaign of deplatforming was exerted upon our venues to cancel Dimitri's appearances. But we were blessed from coast to coast with talented organizers and a very determined Mr. Lascaris, who overcame almost every obstacle and ensured that our rights as Canadians to freedom of expression and association were upheld. Dimitri's message regarding the war in Ukraine is very similar to ours. We call upon the Trudeau government to cease and desist from refueling the U.S. proxy war in Ukraine with endless donations of arms and money to the Ukrainian government and instead use its, quote, good offices to seek a negotiated end to the conflict before it spins out of control into a wider European war or even a nuclear confrontation between the great powers. The stakes could not be higher. We hope the talk by Dimitri tonight will inspire Canadians to take action for peace now. We encourage listeners to join one of our 45 member organizations across this fair land. If there isn't one in your neck of the woods, please form one and affiliate with our network. It's not a daunting task. Next week, for example, several member organizations will be holding pickets, demonstrations, and social media blitzes to counter the NATO summit in Vilnius, Lithuania. All it takes to join in is to convince a few friends to picket your local MP's office with a few signs or a banner saying, hashtag Canada out of NATO. Hand out a flyer and issue a media release with which we can help or come up with an action of your own. If you live in the Toronto area, the only city in Canada in which Dimitri was completely deplatformed, Please be advised that we will be holding the very last event of the tour this Saturday, July 8th at 1.30 p.m. at the Northern District Branch of the Toronto Public Library. Finally, kudos to the endorsers of Dimitri's Canada-wide Tour for Peace. They are the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, VOW, the Women's International League for Peace and Justice, WILPF, the International Manifesto Group, and Just Peace Advocates. Thank you for standing firm in the face of a fierce backlash. And now I'd like to hand the meeting back to Ivan. Dimitri Laskaris is a lawyer and a journalist who is based in Montreal, Canada and Athens, Greece. He began his legal career over 30 years ago with the Wall Street law firm of Sullivan and Cromwell, first working in New York City and then Paris, France. 
returned to Canada in 2004 and founded Canada's largest team of securities fraud class action lawyers, recovering over 500 million for defrauded investors. In 2012, Dimitri was named one of the 25 most influential lawyers in Canada by Canadian Lawyer Magazine. From 2012 to 2022, Dimitri was a board member and correspondent for the Real News Network based near Washington, DC. He has been a guest lecturer at the law schools of the University of Toronto, York University, and University of Ottawa. In 2020, Dimitri ran to be a leader of the Green Party of Canada, finishing second out of eight candidates. His more detailed biography can be found here uh, at dimitriscaris.org uh, forward slash about forward slash. Is it my turn? <laughs> Thank you, Ivan. Uh, such a pleasure to be here. Uh, I can't uh, say that I'm uh, as alert as I've been uh, at the outset of this tour. We've just completed a, uh, a whirlwind tour of the country. Uh, it started in London, Ontario, my hometown. Uh, and then uh, we headed to Hamilton, where we had a rousing event and then Toronto where we were deplatformed, but we managed to have uh, an impromptu meeting on the patio at the pub beside the uh, OPSU's headquarters. Uh, went to Winnipeg where we were twice canceled in 24 hours and the extraordinary local organizers found us a third venue at the 11th hour. Uh, and we managed to bring out uh, a, a quite sizable crowd. Uh, then we were off to Regina, um, Vancouver, Victoria, uh, back to Montreal where Again, we were deplatformed in my own my own city. Uh, off to Halifax, Fredericton. Last night we were in Ottawa, and every step of the way there have been determined efforts to silence us. And I hope that at the end of this presentation, and I'm going to make a, uh, I apologize in advance, a somewhat detailed explanation, which nonetheless cannot provide a comprehensive uh, analysis of the history of this war. I'm going to try to focus on things that I think are particularly important. But I hope when you've finished hearing what I have to say this evening, that whether or not you agree with me, you'll understand that the motivation uh, is to achieve a peaceful resolution of this war as quickly as humanly possible. It is, a, it is a motivation which every single person associated with this tour has and uh, is being driven by. Uh, we're all passionately committed to that goal. And although you may have disagreements with our views as to how to get there, uh, please understand that that's why we're doing this. And I find it rather alarming that uh, a group of people like those who have gathered together with me on this tour to make this happen and who have that motivation are constantly being harassed, uh, deplatformed, vilified. vilified. Uh, and uh, all that I can say is, you know, the right to free speech is one that is fundamental to democracy. It's cliche, but it has to be said. And the best way to protect our right to free speech is to, to express ourselves. And particularly when our right to free speech is sought to be suppressed. Uh, so I wanna also thank Ivan for that wonderful uh, speech. I had no idea what Ivan was going to say in his opening speech. He's uh, evidently much more succinct uh, than I am. <laughs> Nonetheless, manages to say quite a bit in the little time that was allocated to him. Uh, and I much appreciated what he had to say. Uh, also for the kind words that Ken had to offer. Uh, I'm coming to you this evening from the unceded territory of the Ganyangahaga people in what uh, most of uh, the non-Indigenous people of this country refer to as Montreal, and I'm privileged to work and, uh, and live on this land. Um, I'm going to uh, begin my presentation uh, by switching over to my PowerPoint. If you bear with me here, I'll try to make this happen quickly. Sorry, I forgot to share screen. My apologies. Now, I just want to confirm with our friends, you can see the uh, the slide, I imagine. Is that correct? You can see the slide making peace with Russia one time, one handshake at a time? Yes. Okay, thank you. 
So I'd like to say a little bit more about my motivation for doing this uh, at the request of the Canada-wide Peace and Justice Network. Um, in November of last year, on the 22nd of that month, uh, humanity was almost plunged into World War III. And what happened on that particular day, uh, those of us who were paying attention, and many of us were, were quite uh, alarmed by it, is that two missiles uh, exited Ukrainian airspace, entered airspace, the airspace of Poland, which is, as we all know, a NATO member, landed in an agricultural region of the country and killed two Polish farmers. And immediately, as has been customary uh, in this war, the Western fingers were pointed at the government of Russia and its military forces. And you see here an article from, I believe it was Reuters, uh, published uh, in November of last year, uh, quoting the ubiquitous uh, but unidentified senior US intelligence official as telling Reuters that Russian missiles had crossed into NATO member Poland, killing two people. And many of us also know that under Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, there is an obligation of reciprocal defense. And so uh, our nuclear-powered allies, our nuclear-armed allies, the United States, Britain, and France, along with Canada and all other NATO members, were, if the claim of the unidentified uh, intelligence official from the United States had been believed and acted upon, we were obliged to come to the defense of Poland. And we would have been into a full-blown World War III. Fortunately, cooler heads prevailed. And within 24 hours, the Polish government, the US government, and the head of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, all acknowledged that they had come to the conclusion after examining the debris from the missile and other information that was available to them, that in fact, these missiles had been fired by Ukrainian forces. Uh, to this day, we don't really know how that happened. As far as I'm aware, there has been no investigation into whether that was intentional or accidental. Uh, but whatever uh, the truth of that, about all of that may be, it is certainly clear given Article 5 and the initial narrative that was put forward by Western powers, and particularly these ident unidentified intelligence officials, that we were on the brink of World War III at that time. And astonishingly, our supposed ally, Volodymyr Zelensky, continued to insist after his allies in the Polish uh, and American governments and in the NATO leadership confirmed that the missiles were Ukrainian, he continued to insist that in fact the missiles had been fired by Russia. And after some several days of his continuing to insist this, people just kind of stopped listening to him, mercifully. I agree with uh, Professor Noam Chomsky. Uh, and of course, I've only highlighted one moment in time at which we came perilously close to nuclear war since this invasion began. And there may have been many others, I'm sure there were. Uh, a lot of them we probably don't even know about and never will. Uh, but Professor Chomsky has argued quite eloquently that this is the most dangerous point in human history. Uh, of course, there's the obvious danger, or one that should be obvious to us all, and I'm going to talk about some polling evidence, which will highlight for you just how obvious this danger has become to Canadians, and that is the danger of nuclear Armageddon. But what's tr truly alarming about the current circumstance is that this is happening against the backdrop of a climate crisis that's spinning out of control. There's absolutely no prospect, my friends, of us managing this crisis responsibly, let alone solving it, unless we achieve an unprecedented level of international cooperation. As an example, states have to come together and decide, those that have consumed the largest part of the carbon budget, how they are going to divide up the remaining budget in an equitable manner with the global south and all those countries that did so little to cause the climate emergency. We have to come up with a funding mechanism for mitigation for the global south. We have to come up with an emission reductions plan, which is both adequate and enforceable. And we don't have either of those things right now. We would have to get well beyond the level of cooperation we've experienced probably at any point in our lifetimes to have any hope of resolving the climate emergency. And this war is causing us to head precisely in the opposite direction. Cooperation is being undermined. Distrust is being exacerbated. Belligerence is out of control. The world is dividing into two camps. And rather than commit their resources and their goodwill towards resolving the climate emergency, we're looking across each other at the nuclear abyss. We're in real trouble, folks. And that is ultimately the motivation that I, and I believe every person associated with this tour had for embarking on this difficult journey. 
You may recall, those of you who are my age or older, uh, that back in the Soviet era, the United States undertook a program of arming the Mujahideen who were fighting the Soviet army in Afghanistan. And there was a book that came out at the time written about the Congressman Charlie Wilson who spearheaded this initiative. And it became the subject of a Hollywood movie starring Tom Hanks, known as Charlie Wilson's War. And if you look at the cover of this book, I want to draw your attention to the, uh, the byline, the extraordinary story of the largest covert operation in history. I stress the word covert. Let's recall that what we were providing to the Mujahideen, who later morphed into Al-Qaeda and became, according to U.S. and other Western governments, a mortal threat to all that we hold dear, uh, we were arming them with weapons that were far less lethal, destructive, and sophisticated than those being given to Ukraine. We're giving to Ukraine main battle tanks. We're talking now about giving them F-16s, Patriot air defense missiles, long-range cruise missiles. What we were giving to the Mujahideen basically were Stinger shoulder-fired uh, anti-aircraft missiles, some RPGs, and some small arms. Essentially, that was it. And nonetheless, the persons in positions of power and influence in the U.S. government decided that this had to be done covertly. Now, let's contrast that with what's happening today. We are literally falling over ourselves to be seen globally as the country that is making the most significant contribution militarily to the war effort of the Ukrainian state. We're not, there's nothing about this that's covert. We're bragging about it. We're flaunting it. We're sticking it in the face of the Russians. At least back then, they had the good sense to be aware that if, if this had become obvious and provable, our arming of the Mujahideen, this could spiral out of control. Well, the restraint has gone out the window, my friends. We don't know what diplomacy and prudence looks like anymore internationally uh, in the West, I'm, I, I'm afraid to say. So I'm going to proceed in this presentation, having talked to you about my motivation for doing this, uh, in four parts. First, I'm going to tell you what my position is on how Western government should respond to this war. Next, I'm going to explain the basis of my position. Why do I take that position? Third, I'm going to talk to you about my trip to Russia and what I learned there. And finally, and most importantly, I'd like to talk to you about what a peace deal might, might look like. Uh, I'm just one person with some ideas to offer, but I think they can inform us in terms of how we should approach the question of resolving this war. And then after, afterwards, we'll throw it open uh, for the Q&A. So what is my position? It's been much misrepresented. You'll hear people saying that I'm pro-Russia, that I want the Russians to crush and destroy the Ukrainians. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, what I want is the killing to stop. And I want the suffering to end, or at least to be minimized to the greatest possible degree. And to me, the best way to do that is first and foremost to provide robust humanitarian aid for the innocent victims of the war. Whether they be pro-Russian or pro-Ukrainian, their political inclinations shouldn't matter. If they're innocent victims, they deserve our support. But we should deliver that aid, in my submission to you, directly through non-governmental organizations that we can trust, because there is plenty of evidence that the Ukrainian government is rife with corruption, and much of that aid will not ultimately reach its intended beneficiaries. Secondly, we should provide robust sanctuary and protection for those who have managed to flee the war zone. Uh, thirdly, we should impose an arms embargo on all warring parties. And by the way, I believe Canada should impose an arms embargo on every warring party on the face of this earth. We shouldn't be selling weapons to anybody. I would like to see us have no military industrial complex at all. But certainly in this war, it's my position that we should not be providing deadly weaponry to, to either side in the conflict. Fourthly, no economic sanctions that are not approved by the UN Security Council. Fifth, a legal prohibition on participation by Canadians in the hostilities, whether on the Russian side or the Ukrainian side. And finally, support for negotiations to end the war. And if we've taken those first five steps, we could actually offer ourselves as a neutral mediator. Right now, there's nothing neutral about our behavior, and we have really no prospect under the circumstances. We literally are at war with Russia, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, there's no hope of us acting as a a productive mediator in this particular existentially dangerous war. Now, you hear or will hear uh, and probably have heard that the position I've articulated to you is an extreme position, an extreme left position, an extreme right position on the fringe of the political spectrum. Well, let's start by looking at some 
polling data, which actually just came out last week to assess whether or not it is in fact that extreme. I'm sorry, I'm showing you, I, I should, I misspoke. I'm showing you polling data from February of last year, of this year. So this is February, 2023, and I'm gonna show you some more recent data in a moment. And what people were asked in February of this year by uh, the National Post and Ledger uh, polling agency, amongst other things, was whether they support providing military equipment. 32%, less than a third said they wanted more. 36% said, stay the course, don't do more, just do what you've done. Uh, then some 17% uh, said, do less, we're sending too much weaponry. And 15% said, I don't know. Uh, so I would ask you to consider exactly how fringe, based on those numbers, is this position that I've articulated to you of not sending weapons to Ukraine or to the Russians uh, in light of this polling data. Now, this is more recent polling data. It came out, in fact, last week, again, by the National Post. This time, they did it with a different polling agency, Maru. And one question they asked was, uh, should the Ukrainians keep fighting? And people were given a variety of options. And one of the options was keep fighting Ukraine backed in the war by the Western military alliance called NATO and supplying it with weapons and money. Uh, and the, the goal being to push Russia out of the Ukrainian territory it took in an invasion. Um, and 56% of the population said yes to the, that question. Um, and then some 17% said stop the war right now. Uh, and 27%, obviously a high degree of uncertainty, nearly half the population either said, I don't know what we should do, uh, or uh, said outright that we should stop uh, fueling this context and stop the war right now. So again, I ask you to consider just how fringe is the position on arming Ukraine that I've articulated to you today. That proposition that this is an extreme outlier of a view becomes completely untenable when we look at the global picture. Here, I've only talked to you about polling data from Canada. But before I get there, another very important aspect of this poll that came out last week, people, I, I frankly found this astonishing, the most alarming piece of data I've come, seen come out of a polling agency for a long time. People were asked what they thought the probability was of the alliance NATO being drawn into a European Russian nuclear war. 53% said yes, 53%. More than half Canadians be, believe we are heading to a, a nuclear war. 50% uh, said they thought a nuclear war occurring involving Russia, not only European countries, but also North America. One half of the Canadian population said this. And then some 61% thought that Russia was going to blow up the Ukrainian nuclear power plant, which they happened to control, by the way. Uh, so it, it seems a bit odd to me that people would believe they're going to blow up a nuclear power plant that they themselves control. But in any event, it'll give you a sense of the public sentiment in this country. And what I find so astonishing about this number, the expectation that there's going to be a nuclear war is that there ain't nobody, ain't nobody protesting en masse in this country. There have been people, including the peace groups, some of whom are involved in this tour, that have had sporadic, uh, you know, small scale protests, and they've done the best that they can, and they're doing heroic work. But I would have thought that if 53% of the population thinks that we are heading for a war that could very well result in the extinction of humanity, that there would be mass protests, at least as large and as adamant as those we saw during the Vietnam War. But even though we see so many people believing that we're headed to a nuclear conflict, almost nobody is out there protesting. And we should be deeply concerned about that, ladies and gentlemen, I think for obvious reasons. And perhaps the reason for this complacency, I think there are many, is that over time, because we've happened to avoid the nuclear calamity for so long, uh, and because we've heard all of this nonsense about tactical nukes and small-scale nuclear weapons, people think that there could be a nuclear exchange even uh, without massive destruction happening to us here at home or, in, or to our allies in Western Europe. This is, however, a pipe dream. And this is coming from the Center for Disarmament. This is a new a 2019 article in which the author and expert in disarmament said, there is no such thing as a small nuclear war. And he goes on to explain, and there have been many simulations which have shown this, that in 1982, the Reagan administration organized a war game known as Proud Profit involving high-level defense officials 
And during the exercise, which played out over two weeks, the US wanted to test the theory of limited nuclear strike. What they found was that the Soviet Union perceived in even a low yield nuclear strike as an attack and responded with a massive missile salvo. The result was catastrophe, said Paul Bracken, a political scientist and Department of Defense advisor. And you may recall that it wasn't long after this, after this simulation was done in 1982, that Ronald Reagan, the Cold Warrior, embarked upon the most historic program of disarmament with his Soviet counterparts. A project, by the way, which has been largely dismantled by the Bush, Obama, and Trump administrations. And I'm talking here about their withdrawal from the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, from the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, and from the, uh, the nuclear deal with Iran under the Trump administration, even though the IAEA certified that Iran was complying with the deal. It is the United States, over the vigorous objections of the Russian Federation, which has effectively dismantled the disarmament architecture that was set up uh, and it's about the best thing he ever did uh, by Ronald Reagan and his Soviet counterparts. But the key point here is there is no such thing as a small nuclear war. One of those bombs is launched, the likelihood is we're all dead. That's the reality. And yet 53% of Canadians expecting that this is going to happen, we can hardly mount a mass protest on a Vietnam War scale in this country. Now, I talked to you about globally what the picture looks like. This is a map from the Economist, hardly a pro-Russian magazine, uh, intelligence unit, uh, showing the countries in blue that have decided to arm Ukraine. And you'll see in the light blue, uh, those are countries that have delivered light weapons or ammunition to Ukraine, and the green are delivered non-lethal military aid. So only the blue, which have delivered heavy weapons, and the light blue, which have delivered light weapons, have decided to arm Ukraine. So what we can see here is that virtually no country in Latin America, including our close trading partner, Mexico, is sending weapons to Ukraine. Just two countries in all of Africa have sent weapons to Ukraine. Almost nobody in the Middle East has sent weapons to Ukraine. Uh, and only one country, I believe that's Pakistan and Asia, has sent weapons to Ukraine, and those were light weapons. The vast majority of states, representing the vast majority of the human population, have elected not to send weapons to Ukraine. What about sanctions? Again, this is from the intelligence unit of The Economist magazine. And you see here in blue the countries that have imposed sanctions on Russia. It's the usual suspects, the same ones who are sending the weapons and fueling the prolongation and intensification of this war. Almost nobody in Latin America has sanctioned Russia, nobody in Africa, nobody in the Middle East, and uh, virtually nobody in Asia, other than Japan, South Korea, and I believe that's Taiwan. So the position I'm articulating to you in terms of arming Ukraine and imposing uh, severe economic sanctions on Russia is in fact mainstream globally. Uh, we like to think that we represent the international community. We do not. That's a lie that we hear repeatedly. The international community is opposed fundamentally to the policies that the West has adopted with respect to this war. Now, before I tell you why I have this position, I'd like to talk a little bit about thinking critically about this war. It's something that we seem to have lost the capacity to do, including, frankly, a significant proportion of people on the left and self-described progressives. Uh, one thing you may notice, I urge you to review the media uh, reports coming out of the West with an eye to determining its sources, the typical sources. What I have found is that it's almost always the US, British, or, or Ukrainian governments. So let's talk about the credibility of the first two, the US and the British governments. The Pentagon paper showed beyond a shadow of a doubt that four successive presidential administrations lied through their teeth about virtually every aspect of the Vietnam War. We know to a certainty that the claim that Saddam Hussein possessed weapons of mass destruction was a bald-faced lie as was the claim that he was involved in 9-11. And some several hundred thousand, perhaps even as many as a million or more innocent Iraqis have died because of that criminal invasion. And we know from the Afghanistan papers and also the ultimate outcome of that two decade long war, that that too was based on a pack of lies. For example, we were told that they were there to protect the women of Afghanistan against the scourge of Taliban oppression. Well, who's in power today, ladies and gentlemen? 
who's afflicting the women of Afghanistan with oppression today. The very people that we were told we were going there to overthrow and to protect Afghan women from. So why would anybody, anybody take at face value anything that the US or British governments have to say about a war? How often do they have to lie to us before we finally stop taking them at their word? Now, what about the Ukrainian government? I indicated that's also been a major source of the uh, claims made in the Western media. Well, a few weeks ago, Josep Borrell, who's essentially the foreign minister of the EU, said in a public speech that if we don't support Ukraine, Ukraine will fall in a matter of days. And within a couple of days, Boris Pistorius, the German defense minister, went even further and said that if we stop supporting Ukraine, it will disappear tomorrow. Now, if anything they've said about this war is true, it's probably that. All indications are objective evidence leads to the conclusion that the Ukrainian government has become dependent upon its very survival on Western government support, both not just militarily, economically. It can't even pay civil servants without Western government support. It is a complete dependent of the West at this stage. Now think about that in terms of motivation. What kind of a motivation does that create? What kind of incentives does that create for the Ukrainian government? Well, if you know that your survival depends upon the support of Western states, and you know that it, to at least some degree, what the governments of those states can do is constrained by public opinion, you have a profound incentive to inflame public opinion against your enemy. Everything you do depends upon inflaming Western public opinion against your enemy. So you will constantly be claiming atrocities, whether there's evidence to support the claims or not, whether the uh, evidence simply is inadequate to come to any conclusion at all. You will paint your, your, your opponent out, the Russian government and its leader, Vladimir Putin, as Hitler. You will uh, assert aggressively that if the Ukrainian government falls, the Russian Federation ain't going to stop there, and it's going to invade NATO, and eventually it'll end up on our shores here in North America. You're going to do everything you can to terrify the populations upon whose support you depend for your very existence. That's just inevitable. That's what any government in Ukraine's position would be incentivized to do. So ultimately, we shouldn't take what the Ukrainian government says at face value. We shouldn't take what the US government says at face value. We shouldn't take what the Russian government says at face value. It too has an incentive to lie. It's in a war after all. All governments in times of war have a strong incentive to lie. So what do you do? You test their claims against the available independent and objective evidence. And if there's inadequate, uh, avail uh, objective and independent evidence to make a determination, and I think based on what I've seen that with the vast majority of the claims that have been made against the Russian Federation, the objective available evidence simply is inadequate, you then withhold your judgment. If the evidence doesn't support what's being claimed by any party to the conflict, you reject the claim. And if the evidence supports it, you accept the claim and act accordingly. But we shouldn't take anything that any of these belligerents is saying at face value. And certainly, we should be able to agree on this much, that the United States government and its allies in the West could not give a hoot about international law, democracy, or human rights, because they systematically violate those things. In fact, the US government right now is providing $4 billion a year in military aid to Israel, which is now widely acknowledged by the Western human rights community to be an apartheid state. How much do we have to have by way of evidence that they don't care about human rights, international law and democracy before we stop believing them when they tell us that that's why they are fueling this war in Ukraine? And so if that's not what they're doing, if that's not their objective, what is it? Well, I suggest that looking at the totality of the US government's behavior in the post-World War II period, and looking at even at statements coming out of the mouths of the less discreet uh, officials in the Biden administration, coming out of the mouths of the so-called experts at the Rand Corporation and Stratfor and other geopolitical consulting firms, it's pretty clear what's really going on here. What's really going on here, and Ivan touched upon this, is US hegemony. This is about removing from uh, the, uh, the, the goal of uh, US domination of global affairs, any and all obstacles. And the Russian Federation has become a significant obstacle to US domination. And we can all say with a high level of confidence that if 
the US government were to achieve its objectives in this war, which are obviously to inflict a grievous blow on Russia, no matter how much damage that does to Ukraine, uh, the next target is gonna be China. And if by some miracle, we get through the destruction of the Russian Federation without a nuclear exchange, ladies and gentlemen, we would be foolish to think we would survive a nuclear exchange or avoid one if we end up going to war, either through a Taiwanese proxy or directly against the People's Republic of China. They've had enough. They're not going to be bossed around anymore. And whether we like it or not, that's the reality. And the US government is simply unwilling to accept that reality. Now, what I'm telling you here today is being articulated by people who are far more accomplished and eloquent and well-known than I am or will ever be. Uh, Professor Noam Chomsky essentially says what I've told you thus far. Dr. Jeffrey Sachs, director of the Columbia University in Earth Institute. Professor Radhika Desai of the University of Manitoba. Jacques Beau, a former Swiss intelligence officer who worked in NATO in Eastern Europe. Professor Nikolai Petro, the former US State Department advisor who is now a professor at the University of Rhode Island. Uh, professor Ivan Kachanovsky, a Ukrainian, uh, who is a professor at the University of Ottawa. Tamara Lorintz, a doctoral student at the Balsili School. And Professor Paul Robinson, a, a University of Ottawa professor who uh, was a British officer in the, in the British military and also um, uh, it, it came back uh, to Canada and I believe also served in the Canadian military for some time. And I'm just giving you a small sample here. There are many other eminent intellectuals who are articulating essentially this message and have been for months. And the one thing that they all have in common is that you won't find mention of the made hardly any at all in the mainstream media. The only thing you're hearing from in the mainstream media are the people who support Western government policy towards this devastating war, or who criticize it from the perspective that Western governments are not being hawkish enough, that we're not sending enough weaponry, we're not spending enough money on merchants of death. But an anti-war message in the mainstream media, you're not likely to find that anywhere. So what are the true causes of this war? And again, I ask you to think critically as you listen to what I'm going to suggest to you are the true causes of this war. NATO expansion. In fact, it is the case that NATO powers assured the government, the Soviet government of Mikhail Gorbachev that NATO would not expand eastward. How do we know this? because there are dozens of declassified documents sitting in the National Security Archive of George Washington University, which say exactly that. And you can go and see those documents for yourself. This isn't some fringe extreme leftist or right-wing person who's telling you this. These are declassified US government documents. And even if that weren't true, what is true is that leading figures from the US foreign policy establishment said and predicted in the 90s that NATO expansion eastward would be a disaster. One such person was George Kennan, considered he had been a, an ambassador to the USSR for the United States for a number of years, considered to be one of the most sophisticated minds in US foreign policy. He wrote a, he did an interview with Thomas Friedman and he said, where he said, and this I believe was 1998, that NATO expansion would become a catastrophe. William Perry, the defense secretary under, uh, under Bill Clinton threatened to resign because he opposed NATO expansion so passionately. And in fact, he said so himself recently when uh, criticizing the decision to take NATO right up to the borders of the Russian Federation. The fact of the matter is that it was entirely foreseeable that Russia would view this as an existential threat. Why would it not view it as an existential threat? Ukraine is a few hundred kilometers from Moscow. We have enough nukes to destroy the world many times over. The only country that's ever used them is the United States government, and it used them on civilian targets, knowingly incinerating tens of thousands of Japanese children at a point where the Japanese government was on the verge of surrender. And it's well known that the US government likely did that in order to intimidate the Soviet government. NATO left Libya in smoking ruins. NATO killed hundreds of innocent civilians in Serbia, and then supported the carving up of that country, creating against the vigorous objections of the BRICS countries and the Serbian government, a new state called Kosovo. NATO left Afghanistan in smoking ruins. Anybody with half a brain looking at the conduct of NATO in the post-World War II period, and especially its most powerful member, would perceive NATO to be an aggressive military alliance. That is an entirely justified fear for any country to have, 
especially one that's perceived to be a geopolitical rival of the United States. What is another true cause of this war? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, there is in fact a serious problem with neo-Nazism uh, in, the, the, in uh, Ukraine, and I'll have more to say about that in a moment. Uh, and so reckless was the US government with respect to this problem, this obvious problem of neo-Nazism that John McCain in 2014, as a coup was unfolding in Ukraine, went to Kiev and met with leaders of the far right in Kiev and expressed US government support for their cause. Now, it's not just that which tells us that there was a coup in 2014. We have the ultimate evidence, evidence that you almost never have when you're trying to ascertain historically whether there was a subversion of a, of a, a sovereign state's democracy. We have a recording of a conversation between a senior US State Department official, Victoria Newland and the US ambassador to Ukraine at the time, Jeffrey Pyatt, which was probably intercepted. It was a conversation probably inter intercepted by Russian intelligence and its authenticity has not been denied by the US government. In fact, the Obama administration apologized to the Europeans for what Newland said in this call. And what she said in this call, after being told by the Ukraine, uh, the ambassador to Ukraine of the United States, Jeffrey Pyatt, that the Europeans wanted Valery Klitschko to become the prime minister in the coup government, what she said was, fuck the EU. Yats is the guy. Her speech is famous for that phrase, Yats is the guy. And who's Yats? Yats is Yevgeny Yatsenyuk, a neoliberal politician in the opposition at that time. And several weeks later, by which time, Viktor Yanukovych, the democratically elected president of Ukraine, who was trying to maintain good relations with Russia had been overthrown, Yats did in fact become the prime minister of Ukraine, exactly as Newland had demanded. Now, I ask you to consider uh, an inversion of these facts. And let's imagine that, in fact, this was not a conversation between Newland and Pyatt, but it was a conversation that took place in 2016 during the election with Trump and Hillary Clinton, in which Sergei Lavrov the foreign minister uh, of Russia, speaking to the uh, Russian ambassador to the United States, is advised by the ambassador that the Chinese favor Hillary over Trump because they think that Hillary is going to be less uh, belligerent towards China than Trump will be. And in the conversation, this imaginary conversation, we hear Lavrov say, fuck China. Trump is the guy. And sure enough, Trump then proceeds to win. He defeats Hillary in a shock election victory, and the recording comes to light. Does anyone on this call doubt for one second that every single member of the US Congress and every single member of the United States Senate and the president and everyone in his cabinet would have screamed bloody murder and would have said that there had been a subversion of American democracy, that there had been a coup d'etat? Of course they would have said that. In fact, we could have found ourselves in World War III if such a recording had come to light in 2016. But when the Americans do it in Ukraine, there's nothing to see here, folks. Just move along. So obvious was this coup that in 2014, after Yanukovych was overthrown, in an interview with the Russian magazine Commerzant, George Friedman, who had been the CEO of Stratfor, a geopolitical and consulting firm in the United States that's very closely tied to the US military industrial complex, referred to it as the most overt or sometimes translated as the most blatant coup in history. That's how obvious it was. But now we're being told that it's just a Putin talking point. The problem with that claim is that the historical record amply supports it. Now, I mentioned the problem of U Ukrainian neo-Nazis. A lot has been said about that. Well, consider this. I could, of course, show you photograph after photograph of Azov battalion members, uh, bearing proudly Nazi insignia, uh, but I'm sure you've seen those images. If you haven't, it's not hard to find them. What I'm going to tell you about is something that less talked about, and that is that in December of uh, 2018, um, the Ukrainian parliament declared a national holiday, a national holiday in favor of Stepan Bandera. Okay, and here is a statement uh, uh, by Ukrainian American author an analyst, Lev Golinkian, who talks about the fact that the party that Stepan Bandera co-founded, he was a notorious 
a Nazi collaborator during the Second World War. He was an anti-Semite, a virulent anti-Semite. He co-founded an organization called the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists. And as Mr. Golinkin says, and there's lots of historical evidence to back this up, he participated in the Holocaust, the OUN did, and a sister organization, the UPA, slaughtered thousands of Jews and 70,000 to 100,000 Poles on their own volition. And we're talking about gruesome massacres. So offended is the Polish government by the declaration of a national holiday for Stepan Bandera that it complains bitterly every year and did so this year on January 1st about the fact that the Ukrainian parliament is glorifying, glorifying this man. And if that's not bad enough, the Ukrainian parliament made it a criminal offense, criminal offense for someone to deny the heroism of Stepan Bandera and banned books which told the truth about Stepan Bandera. Imagine that being subjected to criminal penalties because you say that a Nazi collaborator who's complicit in the mass slaughter of Poles, Jews, and Russians is not a hero. That's the country that we are arming to the teeth, my friends. Even our own media before the invasion acknowledged that Canadian military forces had been training neo-Nazis in the Ukrainian military. This is a report from the Ottawa Citizen, part of the right-wing neoconservative post-media empire. And it, they're telling us here that not only uh, did this happen, but when the Canadian military brass became concerned that it might become known, rather than deal with the problem of training neo-Nazis, they began to talk about how they were going to conceal what had happened from the Canadian public. Again, you can find these reports in the Ottawa, Ottawa Citizen. Another cause of this war there was a civil war in the southeast of Ukraine commencing in 2014, and it resulted in the deaths of over 10,000 people. I believe it's some 14 to 15,000 people before the invasion began. This war began when Yanukovych was overthrown in 2014. It was escalated by Russia in February of last year, but this claim that it only began then is complete and utter nonsense. Again, there's a, a mountain of historical evidence to demonstrate that there was a civil war in Ukraine eight years, seven to eight years before the invasion happened, and that many people who were sympathetic to Russia or Russian speakers were killed, innocent civilians. And what's also been uh, supported by the historical record, and here I'm referring in particular to reports from the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, is that in the days leading up to the Russian invasion in February of last year, there was a massive increase in the shelling of areas inhabited by pro-Russian rebels by the Ukrainian military. There were also reports that the Ukrainian military, after having received massive injections of weaponry and training from NATO militaries, were moving new and more destructive weapons towards the line of contact. So from the Russian perspective, this looked like preparation for an invasion of these areas. Again, the historical record supports it. They'll want you to believe that everything that comes out of the Russian government and, uh, government's mouth is a lie. I'm asking you not to assume that that's the case, but to look at the objective evidence. And everything I'm telling you here tonight, every screen I'm showing to you, is quite consciously and deliberately extracted from a Western mainstream source. I could go to lots of non-Western sources to show you even more compelling evidence, but I don't want to be accused of using biased sources. You can find it. It's there. All you have to do is look. What are the reasons to oppose this war? The number one reason, of course, is that we could end up in a nuclear Armageddon. The stakes could not possibly be higher. That in and of itself is a reason to try to bring this war to a peaceful conclusion as rapidly as humanly possible. Secondly, and I've said this many times, people don't seem to want to you know, consider this, but the prospect of a Ukrainian military victory is remote to non-existence. Now, why do I say that? And I readily acknowledge that I'm not a military expert. I rely on the judgment of people who strike me as being credible and who have mountains of military expertise. So why do I say that? And this is based upon their explanations. Well, it has been widely reported by the Western press that Russia has a massive advantage in artillery and that the vast majority of soldiers are being killed and wounded as a result of artillery strikes. The advantage has often been estimated to be as high as 10 to 1. And in fact, here you're seeing a report from El País, a mainstream Spanish newspaper. Uh, this one came out months ago. 
Uh, but more recently, General Zaluzhny, the head of the Ukrainian military, was complaining about the inability of his forces in the current and ongoing offensive in the southeast of Ukraine uh, to make major gains because they had a massive advantage or disadvantage in artillery. And he himself estimated the, the ratio of Russian artillery to Ukrainian artillery to be 10 to 1, approximately. That's huge. And when you combine it with the fact that after the massive exodus of millions of Ukrainians of military age uh, to Western countries, also many of them have gone to Russia. Uh, many of them are now living in areas under Russian control and are no longer accessible uh, to the Ukrainian military. Russia has a population advantage of approximately five to one. So when you have a military, an artillery advantage of approximately 10 to one, even if it's much smaller than that, even if it's three to one, four to one, and you have a population advantage of five to one, again, even if it's smaller than that, two to one or three to one, the math is inexorable. You are going to run out of soldiers before your enemy. And nobody should doubt the resolve of the Russian Federation. Of course, the Ukrainian people are extremely motivated. But this is happening a few hundred kilometers from Moscow. This is a country uh, which, along with its other Soviet republics, sustained 27 million deaths in the defeat of Nazism. They are seriously concerned about this war. They have every reason to be concerned about this war, the Russians. They are every bit as motivated as the Ukrainian people, and they have the means to destroy Ukraine. So if you call yourself a friend of Ukraine, and you're continuously agitating for more and more weapons to be sent to Ukraine, it behooves you to reflect upon the realistic possibility of Ukrainian success. And in fact, that poll that just came out, I didn't take you there, shows that somewhere in the range of 43% of Canadians currently believe that the war is a stalemate, and less than half of that believe that Ukraine is winning. And that's in an, a media environment where we're constantly being told about Ukrainian successes, real or imagined, and we're constantly being told about Russian failures, real, real or imagined. Even in that media environment, by far the largest group of Canadians thinks it's a stalemate. This will ultimately end in Ukraine's destruction. And if all you care about is helping the Ukrainian people, you should be opposed to the intensification and prolongation of this war by flooding the country with weaponry. Now, we're also told that if we continue to arm Ukraine, its negotiating position will strengthen. But that's in fact not what, what has happened since uh, the last significant success that, military, that Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's military had on the battlefield, which was in September of October of last year. Ever since then, the tide has turned. It actually isn't even a stalemate. The Russian forces have begun to regain territory and the biggest battle of all since that time, and in fact, during the entire war was in the previously Ukrainian held uh, community of Bakhmut. The bloodiest battle in the war was brought to a conclusion about six weeks ago, and Bakhmut has now been lost to the Ukrainians. And Volodymyr Zelensky himself said that if the Russian forces took Bakhmut, the way would be open for them to conquer the whole of the Donbass. And at this particular point, ladies and gentlemen, at least Ukraine retains access to the Black Sea through the city of Odessa, which is considered by many Ru uh, Russians to be a Russian city. If the war were to end now, it could retain a coastline and access to the Black Sea. If it continues, there is a very uh, high risk that it will lose access to the Black Sea and become landlocked, which would be a strategic disaster for Ukraine. So in fact, Ukraine's negotiating position is weakening and it could get a lot weaker in the months ahead if we continue to fuel this conflict. Another reason to oppose the intensification and escalation of this war is that yes, Russia does have some legitimate grievances. There's plenty you can criticize. The very first article I published on my website about this war was an analysis of its legality of the invasion. And I took the position that this violated the UN charter and I condemned it unequivocally. But in the same article, which is called P making peace requires us to see the world through the eyes of our enemy. I talked about the provocations. There were provocations. Russia does have grievances. That doesn't amount to a conclusion that the war was consistent with the UN Charter. It's just a, a realistic assessment of the fact that you cannot solve a problem with what, without knowing what caused the problem. There's absolutely no way to resolve this war by means of compromise if you just keep telling the Russian Federation that all of their grievances, real, or imagined are illegitimate. 
Another reason to oppose the prolongation and intensification of this war is that it's an environmental catastrophe, an absolute disaster. The destruction of Nord Stream, which yes, was probably perpetrated by the United States government, was responsible for the, the largest single emission of methane in recorded history. We saw recently the destruction of a dam. Again, they immediately began pointing fingers at the Russian Federation, even though the areas controlled by Russia were most affected by the destruction of this dam. But whoever destroyed it, it's undeniable that it was an ecological catastrophe. The emissions being put out by the conduct of large-scale land warfare for months and months on end are exacerbating the climate crisis, are consuming the little carbon budget that remains to us, the contaminants that are being introduced into the environment, the mines that are littering the countryside. This is an absolute environmental catastrophe, and all of which is happening against the backdrop of a climate crisis that's spinning out of control. So what I'm saying to you, my friends, is that if you care about planetary health, you should be agitating loudly for this war to be brought to an end. My fellow activists in the climate community should just take off for a little while their climate activist caps and put on their anti-war caps because there ain't no hope of saving this planet if this war gets out of hand. Another reason to oppose this war. The head of Interpol said last year that many of the weapons we're sending there to this government, which yes, is deeply corrupt, are gonna end up in the hands of criminal organizations and quite possibly neo-Nazis. And then of course, there's the cost, the tens of billions of dollars, I think we're somewhere in the range now of $200 billion in total aid to prop up Ukraine, which has become a dependent of the West. All of that money could be used for the homeless, for the poor, for strengthening our healthcare system, for transitioning to a renewable energy economy, but it's being expended on merchants of death and in the destruction of Ukraine. So this is the third part I'd like to talk to you about my trip to Russia. And I, first of all, I wanna emphasize uh, that I made the decision to go there on my own initiative. No one invited me. Uh, there was no welcoming committee. Uh, I made that decision because I was alarmed what I saw happening and I thought that there was an opportunity perhaps to educate myself about the country and maybe help somehow in whatever small way I could to facilitate a dialogue in circumstances where dialogue had completely broken down. Uh, I spent one month in the country. That's the total amount of time my visa permitted me to go. Um, I got no compensation whatsoever for going there. I was not reimbursed a dime for my travel expenses. They came entirely out of my own pocket. I'm not being paid for the speaking tour. My travel expenses for the speaking tour are my own. Uh, I've written dozens of articles about this war. I've not been paid a dime by anybody for any of them. I don't solicit donations on my website for the articles I publish there. Uh, I want it to be crystal clear to everyone, especially when you're operating in such a treacherous political discourse, that I have nothing to gain economically from taking the position that I've taken. I also want to say, and this is by way of disclaimer, that most of the country I didn't even see. Of course, I couldn't do that, such a vast country in a month. Uh, I was confined uh, in that little time available to me to central Moscow. Then I took a train from uh, Moscow to Crimea. It took me 28 hours. Uh, and then in Crimea itself, uh, I was uh, basically assisted by a translator whom I hired at my own expense and a, a driver whom I hired at my own expense and went all around Crimea and spoke to people all around the peninsula. Uh, and then I returned to uh, Moscow for the final 10 days of my trip. In Moscow itself, uh, I was given a tour at the, at, at the suggestion of uh, University of Ottawa professor uh, Paul Robinson by an interesting, interesting Russian fellow who had a doctorate in Spanish literature from Oxford University. Um, and he introduced me to the city uh, during the first 48 hours. And we had many interesting conversations about what was happening in Russia. I went to the economic think, uh, think tank, the Valdai Club, and along with uh, Professor Radica Desai of the University of Manitoba, who happened to be there at the time, uh, I participated in a panel discussion about the movement away from the US dollar. I gave a lecture at McGill University, which is the premier uh, institute in Russia for uh, educating Russian diplomats. And that lecture was delivered to graduate students uh, who spoke fluent English. Uh, I had a meeting at the Russian Foreign Ministry, which I'm going to talk about at some length uh, at the end of my presentation. I, I visited a homeless shelter 
uh, that was operated by a charity, had nothing to do with the Russian government. And by the way, the reason why I did that is because uh, I saw so few homeless people in central Moscow uh, relative to what I see in any, any major Western city that I thought, you know, this can't be the whole picture. This can't, it can't be the case that homelessness is this uh, light in the Russian Federation. Uh, and so what I found out at the shelter was that uh, there was indeed significantly higher homelessness than was apparent to me, but uh, the statistics that I was given didn't suggest that it was any worse uh, than it is in any other capitalist society. I also went to the Russian International Affairs Council, which was co-founded by the current foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, and I spoke to the director there about what peace might look like. Uh, I went to uh, Imimo, which was explained to me to be the largest think tank in Russia, and some 20 different experts were made available to me for two hours. All of them fluent in English. They were they had expertise in uh, the petroleum industry, banking, sanctions, uh, the automobile industry, industrial capacity, and we talked primarily about the impact of the sanctions on the Russian Federation. And what they told me was there had been significant degree of pain uh, inflicted upon Russia, but that the pain had been manageable, that Russia's economy was recovering, and I'm going to come back to that. Uh, in a moment, and uh, that, in fact, our sanctions were forcing the Russian Federation to become more self-sufficient. And if you look at a map of Russia and you just have a passing familiarity with its economy and the levels of education of its people, uh, it shouldn't really surprise us that it's been able to greatly increase its level of economic self-sufficiency in the face of these sanctions. So one wonders about the wisdom, even from a purely hegemonic perspective, of imposing sanctions on this country that's so vast and so well resourced and has a population approaching 150 million people, we may in fact be making this country stronger in the long run, not weaker, not just economically, but also militarily. Now in, in, in Crimea, that's what I saw and did in Moscow. In Crimea, I went to Yalta uh, and I visited the site of that famous conference with Stalin and uh, Churchill and uh, Roosevelt at the end of the war. I went to a Soviet era uh, decommissioned nuclear submarine base called Balaklava. I went to Sevastopol, which is the headquarters of the Black Sea Fleet of the Russian Federation. Uh, and there, there was an attack on Sevastopol at the time that I was there, but fortunately there were no casualties or damage. Uh, that was an attack by way of drone. Uh, I met there with a fellow by the name of Sergei Gorbachev, who is not related to uh, the former premier of the Soviet Union. Uh, but he is the head of the uh, Journalist Union of Russia in Crimea. And we had a very interesting discussion about free speech. And then I took uh, a car up to the northern border of Crimea, uh, where the Kherson region begins. That's basically uh, the edge of the war zone. And there I had a meeting uh, with uh, humanitarian workers at a refugee camp. And one of the the most interesting things about that camp, I inspected it thoroughly. Uh, you know, nobody was carrying weapons. Nobody was in detention. In fact, there were only three people there, uh, refugees at the time, because uh, they transit them very quickly out of there, too close to the war zone to give them sanctuary there. They basically give them a deal with their immediate needs and then uh, facilitate their transfer to other places. Some of them go to Russia. Some of them stay in Crimea, but further away from the war zone. And a good number of them, something in the range of 30%, I was told, go to the West. And this particular family that I met, uh, the, the parents were in their mid-20s. They had a 10-year-old daughter. They didn't want to be interviewed on the record. Uh, they didn't want to be named uh, for obvious reasons. And uh, I asked them where they were going, and they said they were going to Poland. And uh, I found that curious because presumably they could have entered into Poland more easily, geographically speaking, by passing into Poland from Ukrainian-held territory. But instead, they had chosen this circuitous route going south into Crimea and then somehow going west and then going back north again into Poland. And I asked them why they were doing that. And they said because they were highly confident that if they tried to pass into Poland from Ukrainian held territory, that the father would be seized at the border by the, US, the Ukrainian security services and forced to fight in a war he wanted nothing to do with. And the camp workers were, uh, they confirmed all of this to me. And they said to me, you know, here we don't discriminate uh, between people who want to go to the West or want to go to Russia. Our job as humanitarian workers is to facilitate their transit uh, to a safe place. Uh, and we are not concerned about 
as long as they're not coming to Crimea to do damage. And some people do come from uh, Ukrainian held territories to engage in acts of sabotage. It's a war after all. But as long as they're not here to do damage, we will facilitate their transfer to whatever jurisdiction they feel safest. I spoke with dozens of academic students, economic experts, humanitarian volunteers, journalists, and ordinary citizens. And I must say, for what it's worth, I heard very little criticism of the Russian Federation's government. Uh, there was criticism, but it wasn't of the kind uh, that I would have expected reading the Western media. The criticism, to the extent there was criticism, was that the Russian Federation was not being aggressive enough in prosecuting this war to a successful conclusion. A lot of people said it's time for us to take the gloves off. And another criticism, one that I heard even more often, was that the Russian Federation should have intervened military or militarily long before 2022, because after the overthrow of Yanukovych, at which time the Ukrainian military was in uh, a very sorry state, NATO built up the Ukrainian military to become a much more formidable fighting force. Uh, I didn't hear anybody say that uh, Russia was being too aggressive. Uh, there are undoubtedly people there who believe that. Uh, that wasn't a sentiment that was expressed to me personally. Uh, there was universal contempt, universal contempt for the era of Boris Yeltsin. People talk, talk to me about how there had been rampant substance abuse during the 90s under Yeltsin, how people had been plunged into poverty, how women they knew, young women, sometimes teenagers, had been forced into prostitution just to meet uh, their basic needs. Uh, nobody had a kind word to say about Boris Yeltsin whatsoever. And I asked myself, uh, you know, of course, am I hearing pe from people what they honestly believe? Well, what I heard was consistent and is consistent today with the available polling data. I'm showing you a chart uh, that has been compiled and maintained on the website of the Levada Center uh, for decades. Uh, this is the approval rating for Vladimir Putin. Uh, the Levada Center, by the way, has been treated uh, repeatedly by Western media as reputable probably in part because its leadership is very critical of Vladimir Putin. The management of this organization is no friend of his government at all. And what their approval ratings show, their polls, is that from 1999, when Putin first came into power, to the current time, his approval rating has hovered almost entirely uh, in the range of 60% or 59% up to uh, approximately, actually as high as 90%. And it's currently sitting just above 80%. Now, one may say, you know, this was, this is a, a result of propagandization. Or maybe the Russian people are afraid to tell pollsters what they really think for some reason. That's possible. That's one hypothesis. And I'm sure that there's some truth to that because there are restrictions imposed upon free speech in the Russian Federation. And they have gotten worse since the invasion began. Uh, there is a real problem with repression of free speech there, and also, by the way, in Ukraine, where the political opposition has been effectively outlawed, and various laws have been adopted, which place people at the risk of criminal prosecution if they are perceived to be friendly to the Russian Federation. Uh, so there are real problems with freedom of expression in both countries, but we should ask ourselves whether we're any less propagandized than the Russians or the Ukrainians here in the West. After all, we have the most sophisticated propaganda system, bar none, probably the most sophisticated propaganda system in human history. And it's called the United States media. They're extraordinarily effective at propagandizing people. And we live in a country that is constantly bombarded by US government and US corporate propaganda. We don't call it propaganda. You know, we call the corporate propaganda advertising. We call, you know, the Hollywood propaganda entertainment but we're being propagandized. And I'm not aware of any objective scientific analysis which demonstrates that one population or the other is more propagandized. Uh, I think we can say with some confidence that we're all being influenced by misinformation in all of our countries, including the Russian Federation. But in any event, I looked for some objective reasons why there might be this high level of support. So I went to the website of the World Bank. And the first thing I did was I looked at the poverty rate since the Putin era began. And when he first came to power, you can't see it here, but it was up in the range of 27%. You'll see the number there for 2002. 2002 it was around 24.5%, but it was as high as 27 when he first came in. And it went down to 12% uh, by the end of 2020. 
That's a massive reduction. This is World Bank uh, data. Then I looked at life expectancy at birth. That big dip you see on the left side of the screen, that's the mid 90s. That's the Yeltsin era. Life expectancy in the Russian Federation fell to just above 64 years, shockingly low for a country possessing the wealth uh, and the technological sophistication of the Russian Federation. It soared uh, after Vladimir Putin came to power uh, and went up to 73, well above where it was uh, in the final years of the Soviet Union. And it dipped significantly during the pandemic, which we saw in a number of countries. But even after that dip, it was still well above where it had been during the Yeltsin era, and it has recovered significantly since the pandemic ended. And I think it's now back up around 73 years. I'm showing you here again from the World Bank, unemployment figures, that huge peak you see uh, on the left-hand side of the screen where the unemployment rate went to over 13%. That was in the late 90s, in the Yeltsin era, about 96, 97. And then it began to come down after Vladimir Putin took power. And it's now down around, I would say 4.5%. It's nearly at record lows. Uh, I don't have a chart to show you for this, but it's easy, you can find it in the mainstream. Uh, just check out the debt to GDP ratios of major economies and you'll see that the Russian Federation has the lowest debt to GDP ratio of any major economy and one of the lowest in the world. Far below the US, Canada, Japan, France, Germany, you name it. and. Looking at this objectively, and I, I know saying this puts me at risk of being called a Putin apologist. I'm just looking at the numbers. And this is what I see. I see something that's remarkable. And that is that this happened, that the Russian government managed to uh, improve the fiscal situation of the country because it was just a, a fiscal basket case in the 90s, despite the fact that it also was making the necessary investments to increase the lifespan of Russia decrease poverty, uh, and uh, increase employment. And it was doing this, it did this from 2014 onward in the face of aggressive sanctions by Western powers. Um, so I would be so bold as to say that whatever the level of propagandization may be in Russia, and there's definitely propagandization in Russia, there are also objective reasons for the historic uh, and consistent levels of support uh, for their president. And we should bear that in mind. We know we are being urged from the very beginning of this conflict, going all the way back to 2014, to adopt what I call the Star Wars view of this conflict. And the Star Wars view of this conflict is that the US president is Obi-Wan Kenobi and Vladimir Putin is Darth Vader. We're being treated like children. We're being asked to believe that this is a Hollywood blockbuster. Uh, regrettably, uh, ladies and gentlemen, life is much more complex than that. We need to look at the historical record and understand that it's not black and white, as difficult as it is to take that position publicly today. This is a magazine cover from 1996, the cover of Time Magazine. And what you see here is the editors of Time bragging about the fact that the Yanks came to the rescue of Boris Yeltsin and underneath the headline, they say the secret story of how American advisors help Yeltsin win. Basically what happened is that Bill Clinton dispatched uh, his closest advisors to go to Russia secretly, it's not so secret anymore, in order to help Yeltsin overcome his massive unpopularity. And in a, in a, in a highly controversial election, the legitimacy of which is dubious, Yeltsin was returned to power and the, the era of Russian humiliation and impoverishment uh, continued and was intensified. It was after he won that election, in fact, that Russia, I believe, almost defaulted or did default on its debt. Now, let's imagine that during the 2016 election on the cover of TASS, the Russian news agency, you saw a beaming face of Donald Trump and a headline in Russian Russians to the rescue, the secret story of how Russian advisors helped Trump win. How would the American people react to such audacity, such hubris, such arrogance, such open and aggressive interference in the affairs of the American democracy, which we're led to believe it is, 
Of course, there would have been outrage. Of course, everybody would have said that Trump is not the legitimate president of the United States. And in fact, they did say that with a lot less evidence to back it up than we have to question the legitimacy of Yeltsin's government. And remember that Russians remember this as an era of great pain and humiliation. They draw the, they, they're connecting the dots. It's not hard to do. And they see a direct nexus between American interference in their government and the suffering of the Russian people. And all of that informs how they approach NATO, which is US dominated, and how they're dealing with us in this war. We need to be cognizant of that fact if we're seriously concerned about bringing this war to an end before we're all incinerated in a nuclear holocaust. And one last thing I wanna say about the statistics, the IMF, not uh, the Russian Central Bank, the IMF predicts that in this year and next, the Russian economy is going to grow, and the German economy, the so-called powerhouse of Europe, is going to contract, and that the British economy is going to contract even more. No one's imposing devastating sanctions on Germany. No one's imposing devastating sanctions on the UK. It's Russia that has been targeted with these unprecedented sanctions. It's Russia that has seen some $300 billion US of its Russian cent uh, central bank assets confiscated by the West. And yet, the IMF is predicting its economy is going to grow, albeit meekly, whereas the German and British economies will shrink. Well, a lot of that probably has to do with the fact that the Germans and Europeans generally are now forced because of the sanctions and because of the destruction of Nord Stream to purchase liquefied natural gas from the United States, which is much more expensive and also dirtier than Russian gas supplied through uh, maritime and land-based pipelines. And in Germany itself, which is supposed to have a green government, their consumption of coal has increased dramatically this year because the LNG capacity simply isn't there to make up for the loss of Russian gas. So the German economy is essentially being deindustrialized. Its economic success was dependent upon a consistent and large supply of relatively inexpensive Russian gas. Who makes out from all of this? Who's making out like a bandit? The American petroleum industry, of course. And of course, American merchants of death, military contractors. So what did I learn from my journey to Russia? I saw a few overt signs of nationalism. There definitely is nationalism there, but uh, I didn't see nearly as much as I had thought. I'd spent one day in Damascus before I went to Russia. Everywhere I went in Damascus, in that day I saw the portrait of Bashar al-Assad. Uh, I didn't see the portrait of Vladimir Putin anywhere. The only time I saw Vladimir Putin was when I was working out at the gym and he might've been giving an interview to somebody on the television set. Uh, I talked about the homelessness situation. Uh, Moscow itself, again, I can't comment on the condition of other Russian cities, but central Moscow was remarkably clean. It was well-ordered. The subway system was as good as any as I've ever seen. Uh, the number of uniformed police officers that I saw were far lower than those that I normally see in major European and American cities, and even here in Montreal. Now, the country could be overrun by police officers in civilian wear. Of course, that's, I recognize that possibility. I can only tell you what I saw with my own eyes, and that's what I saw. Now, finally, before I talk about peace, I want to share with you some sentiments that were uh, conveyed to me by three of the many Russians that I spoke to. I asked virtually everybody I had a real conversation with if you had a message for people in the West, what would it be? And I picked three that I thought were representative of what I heard. Uh, first one is from Victoria, uh, a humanitarian worker in Sebastopol. She worked at a refugee center there. She was the director. She said, people should analyze the events that happened much earlier, not now. In other words, she's talking about 2014. Do what you think is right deep in your heart. Then I spoke to a gentleman named Mikhail. Mikhail is currently a math professor at a university in Moscow, and uh, he is from the Donbass. He left there in 2010 after graduating with a math degree. He went to pursue graduate studies in Moscow. His mother, uh, his elderly mother, remains 10 kilometers from the front line in the Donbass. And uh, his brother is also there. He has family that has and friends who have fought, some who have died in this conflict, fighting on the, uh, the Russian side in southeastern Ukraine. And one of the things he said to me, you know, when people do criticize the war in Russia, and there are some who do, he acknowledged that. I say, do you want the Ukrainians to be allowed to kill my mother? 
And then he went on and he said, uh, addressing the West, the people in the West should make up their own minds. They must imagine how their daughters and sons will live tomorrow if the West continues down this path. Everything that you Westerners do makes it seem as though you do not want to live tomorrow. And finally, uh, I spoke with uh, a very unusual uh, gentleman by the name of Gennady uh, in Yalta. Uh, so that would be in Crimea. Uh, he has a disabled daughter whom I met, a uh, teenage daughter, and uh, he's married. And at the age of 60 last year, he volunteered, even though he was in Crimea and he was not in any way obliged to do it, uh, to go fight on the side of the pro-Russian separatists in the Donbass. And uh, he returned. He survived that experience. And at the end of my interview of him, which you can see on my website, I asked him that question, what would you say to the West? And he said, East or West people are the same. Sometimes we want to live a better life and compare us with our neighbors. Envy is not a good trait. We should be glad for each other. If you live a better life in the USA or Europe, we are happy for you. I'm a patriot of my country, but I remember back in the Soviet days, we envied people in the West as they lived a better life. Now Russia is rising and others envy that we live a better life now. We do not want a neighbor next door who will have a stone in his pocket to throw at us. Uh, Gennady, interestingly, after he said that to me, that was the end of our discussion, he stood up and he apologized. And uh, I asked him, why are you apologizing? He said, because I feel that my comments to you were undiplomatic. Uh, and I must say that this was a common uh, experience that I had in interacting with Russians. I went there with some trepidation because I don't speak any Russian and it's pretty obvious once I opened my mouth that I come from North America. I expected that some people would be hostile towards me. Most of the people I met had no idea who I was. Uh, they didn't know what my attitude was towards Russia or this war. And yet I never, I never encountered any impoliteness. There was never any hostility. There was never any rudeness. And once I started talking to people there uh, and listening to them, I found without exception, all the people that I spoke to were extraordinarily courteous and very open, but you had to uh, earn their trust. Now, I want to talk in my final section about what a negotiated peace might look like. This is the most important question of all. Um, and before I get into the meat of it, uh, I just want to say that as a lawyer who's practiced for 30 years in litigation, what I essentially have been doing for three decades is dispute resolution. I represent uh, parties in litigation who are basically engaged in the jurisprudential equivalent of a battle or a war, except that people aren't being killed. Usually what's happening is large stakes, uh, large amounts of money are being fought over. Uh, usually sometimes uh, the existence, the very existence of large corporations and businesses is at stake. People's reputations in the business community are on the line. Uh, the consequences, although non-lethal, uh, can be quite severe. And in that context, you can imagine that, you know, emotions can run high. Uh, people can behave irrationally. and uh, it can be very difficult to achieve some kind of common ground. And what I've learned a few things that I think uh, would be applicable to any dispute resolution context, including a military one, is you first of all have to determine who the true uh, decision makers are, as we lawyers call them, counterparties. Now we're told all the time that the it's the Ukrainian government's gonna decide uh, on what terms this war will be ended, if at all, and the point in time at which it will be ended by means of negotiation. Well. I would say two things about that. First of all, I don't think it's realistic. I don't believe for one second that the Americans are going to allow the Ukrainian government to make that decision all on its own after the they've put some $150 billion into the country and are continue, continuing to pour money into it. They're not doing this out of the goodness of their hearts. They are going to take the position that the piper must be paid, and they're the piper. Secondly, uh, whatever their true feelings may be about the autonomy of the Ukrainian government in this conflict, the fact remains that we can't have a durable peace without the United States and its allies sitting at the table. A big problem here is NATO expansion. And whatever happens to Ukraine's membership in NATO, there are NATO military forces and nuclear cap capable missile launchers that have been moved into Eastern Europe, principally in Romania and Poland. And this is a serious threat. It isn't simply claimed to be. It actually is a serious threat to the security of Russia. If we're going to have a durable peace and also one that is in our mutual interest because it will de-escalate 
the potential for nuclear war, something is going to have to be done about the distribution of NATO forces in Eastern Europe. And finally, uh, we cannot achieve a negotiated resolution without a change in tone. And to dramatize my point, I'm going to mention something that just happened outside of Russia. It involved the United States and China. So after a severe deterioration in U.S.-China relations, why? Because the U.S. is butting its nose into Taiwanese affairs and sending you know, warships in the Straits of Taiwan, along with Canada and other Western naval forces. Um, you know, the Americans thought, well, maybe we should try to calm the waters a little bit. So they send Antony Blinken to Beijing, and he spent a few days there. And although the, the talks were very difficult, and the Chinese Premier Xi Jinping was only willing to afford him a short period of time uh, in conversation, it appeared that some progress had been made in easing tensions. And then within two or three days, the President of the United States, Joe Biden, in his typically hubristic fashion, stood up in public and said that Xi Jinping is a dictator. And the Chinese, of course, took great exception to that. Now, you may say, you may say that Xi Jinping is in fact a dictator. Personally, I don't think he is. I think his government has been involved in human rights violations. Uh, I don't think they're as severe as is claimed. Uh, I do think he has a high level of popular support in China. But let's say for the sake of argument, he's a dictator. I can tell you one thing. If you want to ease tensions with a country, whatever you may think about your opponent in your heart, if you're calling them a dictator publicly, a war criminal, a Nazi, a, a Hitlerite, there is no prospect of any kind of a negotiated peace. There's no prospect of de-escalation. We have to learn to speak the language of diplomacy again, whatever we may feel, if we're truly interested in peace. Now, Mr. Zelensky has said repeatedly that he won't sit down at the table unless the Russians withdraw their forces from all the territories of Ukraine that they now occupy. And of course, the Zelensky government uh, defines Ukraine to include Crimea, which was part of, the, part of Russia for some 200 years. And for reasons that are little understood, were transferred by Khrushchev from the Russian Soviet Republic to the Ukrainian Soviet Republic in 1954. So I say that this precondition to negotiations is a guarantee that there will be no negotiations at all. Uh, why do I say that? I say that because, first of all, the presence of Russian forces in these areas in southeast U Ukraine and Crimea is the single largest source of leverage that Russia has in any peace negotiations. So they would be giving up their leverage if they listened to Mr. Zelensky's precondition, if they respected it. They would be giving up almost all of their leverage even before they have any kind of a peace deal in place. But secondly, there are millions of people living in these regions who are perceived by the Ukrainian government, rightly or wrongly, as being pro-Russian. And a good number of them actually did cooperate in some manner, to varying degrees, with Russian military forces and the Russian government over the past several years. If Russia were to withdraw its forces, those people would be exposed to massive retribution. That's just the reality. And a lot of these people are civilians. And they've just been trying to get along with the people who are in control of the areas in which they live. It would be inhumane and irresponsible of us to tell the Russian forces to vacate these areas, allow the Ukrainian military and security services to flood into these areas without any kind of mechanism in place for protecting us as civilians from massive retribution. And the Russians know this, and so do the Russian people, and they would never tolerate uh, any Russian government complying with this precondition even before a peace deal is in place. I think what Mr. Zelensky is doing is he's trying to pretend that he's interested in peace, but in fact, by imposing this precondition, he's making it a certainty that there will be no negotiation. So what would a peace deal potentially look like? Um, I'm going to rely here principally on a statement made by the Deputy Foreign Minister of Russia shortly before I met with uh, a diplomat in the Russian Federation's foreign ministry in Moscow who had served in Canada. And by the way, that diplomat uh, was expelled from Canada after he publicly uh, explained that the grandfather of Christia Freeland was a Nazi collaborator during World War II. That's why he was expelled. Uh, he did the Canadian people a favor 
because she was running around saying that her grandfather was a democracy champion. Um, and for that, he was expelled. And you don't have to take my word for it. Thomas Wacom of the Toronto Star wrote an article about this. The National Post wrote an article about this. The Globe and Mail wrote an article about this. Uh, and I know this because this diplomat provided me copies of those articles when I met with him. Um, and so I looked at the speech of the Russian Federation's deputy foreign minister that was provided to me by this diplomat, and it contained essentially eight demands. And I'm going to go through them with you quickly. The first one is a cessation of hostilities by Ukrainian armed formations and the supply of weapons by Western countries and the withdrawal of foreign mercenaries. Uh, I think if we want the killing to end, it would make sense that uh, we encourage compliance with this demand, although, of course, it would have to be reciprocal. The Russians, too, would have to engage in a cessation of hostilities, stop sending weapons into uh, the southeast of Ukraine and Crimea, and withdraw uh, any foreign military personnel who are fighting on their side. Number two, Ukraine's neutral and non-aligned status, its refusal to join NATO and the EU. Now, of course, this has been very contentious. Uh, and we're told constantly that Ukraine has a right to join NATO. Why should it be deprived of that right? Well, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, I don't believe that Ukraine has any right to join NATO. I don't believe that any country has a right to join NATO. And I say that because I can read a treaty. And Article 10 of the NATO treaty says that in order for any country to be admitted into NATO, every single country has to agree. Every existing member of NATO has to agree. How does anybody get out of that language the concept that Ukraine or any other non-NATO member has a right to join NATO. At most, Ukraine has a right to ask, but every single member has a right to veto the ask and say no. And in fact, this is what Turkey is currently doing all by itself to Sweden's bid to join NATO. It's blocking it because it's not happy with the Swedish government's uh, attitude towards Kurdish rebels. So there's no right, first of all. Uh, secondly, uh, I would go so far as to argue that it's not in the interest of Ukraine that it join NATO. Why do I say that? Well, first of all, Austria, Finland, and Switzerland, uh, throughout the post-World War II period, managed to be neutral. They were never attacked by the Russian Federation. They had robust trade relations with uh, European countries and with North America and with Asia and also with Russia. Uh, and they were truly sovereign states. Certainly, they were in no way, shape, or form the vassals of the Russian Federation. There's absolutely no reason why Ukraine can't prosper in a neutral situation as they did. Uh, and furthermore, and I think we Canadians can say this with some confidence, if you join NATO, which is dominated by the United States in every conceivable respect, you are going to give up a good chunk of your sovereignty. Your military is going to basically become dominated by the U.S. military structure and hierarchy. And you're going to be constantly badgered to increase your military spending to about 2% of GDP, and to spend the bulk of that on weapons that are manufactured in the United States. So being a member of NATO actually involves a very significant degree of sovereignty and fiscal independence. So I would go so far as to say that this would be good for Ukraine, and it would be good for all of us, because after all, wouldn't we want there to be a buffer between nuclear-armed NATO forces and nuclear-armed Russian forces? Do we really want them facing each other across a border? and nuclear missiles being five minutes away from Moscow. I don't think that that's a particularly sensible thing to do. And saying no to Ukraine would simply honor the promise that was made to Mikhail Gorbachev at the time of German reunification. Demand number three, confirmation of Ukraine's nuclear free status. Now, I think this is a no brainer. Why would anybody want any country to get nukes? I think we should be getting rid of the damn things. The last thing we want is another country to get nuclear weapons. Number four, recognition by Kiev and the international community of the new territorial realities. Uh, this is obviously, at least obviously to me, the most contentious and difficult point. So we know that in 2014, after a referendum, which the Russians claim showed in excess of 90% support for reunification with Russia, Crimea and Russia were merged again. Uh, we know that the Russian Federation, after the invasion last year, purported to annex uh, the oblasts in southeastern U Ukraine, Ukraine of Kherson, Zaporozhye, uh, Donetsk, and Luhansk. 
They do not, however, control all of those oblasts. For example, they only control in the range of 60% of Kherson. Now, I notice as a lawyer that the Russian Federation's officials keep using this phrase when they talk about a settlement. They say new territorial realities. They never spell out what that means. What I interpret that to mean is that they're leaving for themselves room for compromise. They could say they have to cede to us, you know, all of these oblasts, whether or not we currently control 100% uh, of these oblasts. But they've, they've never said that. I've never heard that said by uh, a senior Russian official. Uh, certainly, the language they've tended to use is this. And I think that they're being uh, intentionally ambiguous to leave room for maneuver. Now, of course, people are going to say, well, hold on a second here. We shouldn't be making any territorial concessions. R r borders are sacred. They're inviolable. Uh, I personally uh, you know, find it almost comical to hear a leader of a Western country, particularly a colonial power like the United States or Britain or France, claim that the borders of sovereign states are inviolable. I mean, for centuries, for centuries, the colonial powers, right up until... Uh, the current time, have been dividing up borders of sovereign states, carving them up, rejiggering them in order to achieve their own geopolitical agenda. And in fact, this is what they've done this in Africa. They've done it in the Middle East. They did it in Asia. They did it in Latin America. And this is, in fact, what they're doing right now in Serbia. So the, the, the Kosovo, which has been, was part of Serbia for centuries, unilaterally declared independence, and Western countries uh, not all of them, by the way, but many of them rushed to recognize Kosovo as independent state, but the BRIC states representing the majority of the global population have not recognized Kosovo. And of course, this was done over the vigorous objections of the Serbians, backed by the Russians, the Chinese and India and Brazil and South Africa. So is it really the case that Western powers think borders are inviolable? What about Palestine? The West Bank and Gaza have been reserved by the United Nations for a sovereign Palestinian state. The Palestinians have never had any sovereign state since the creation of Israel. And the land that was supposed to be given to them for the purpose of their having a sovereign state has now been almost entirely gobbled up by settlements, Israeli settlements, that violate a blatant violation of the Fort Geneva Convention. And we, not only are we not arming the Palestinians, and by the way, if you want to make your MP squirm, ask them two questions the next time you're sitting across from your MP. Ask them if they support sending weapons to Ukraine. They're going to say yes. And then ask them if they support sending weapons to Palestinians. And just watch them squirm. There is absolutely no logical explanation, no principled reason to support sending weapons to Ukrainians and not support sending weapons to Palestinians. And in fact, we're doing the exact opposite. As I mentioned, the US gives $4 billion of military aid every year to Israel. And without that aid, it could not oppress the Palestinian people anywhere near to the extent that it does. So I frankly find it completely laughable that Western governments are now telling us that borders are inviolable. They're not sacred, human lives are sacred. So nonetheless, it is difficult. It's a very difficult issue. And what I would suggest is that we think about this in terms of the right to self-determination. That is a human right. And who are we to tell people living in these regions? If in fact, the majority of them want to be part of Russia or want to be independent of Ukraine, what right do we have to tell them that they can't do that? That they have to live under a regime in Kiev, which they regard as illegitimate because of the overthrow of the uh, pro-Russian president, as he's called, Viktor Yanukovych in 2014. So what I would say, there are certainly legitimate criticisms you can make against the referenda that were held. I recognize that. So why don't we organize an international plebiscite in each of these four oblasts, internationally supervised plebiscite done on terms that are agreed to by negotiation with the Russian Federation and the Ukrainian government, and then respect the will of the people after an appropriate period of campaigning, whatever it may be whether it's back into Ukraine, back into Russia, or independence. I think that would simply be honoring the right to self-determination of these people. And it is the most, uh, I think, realistic and humane resolution to this extraordinarily difficult situation that we now confront. Demand number five, the denationalization of Ukraine. Uh, sometimes 
uh, you hear the phrase denazification of Ukraine. Very clear to me what this means. Uh, unclear, I should say. I don't know exactly what the Russians have in mind. So I'm going to throw out an idea, nothing more than that, which may or may not be acceptable to them, may or may not be acceptable to Ukraine. My point in offering this idea to you is just to suggest that there are ways to think about this demand that shouldn't be objectionable to us, shouldn't be problematic to us. Uh, what about doing the following in order to address the demand of denazification? Number one, you abolish the national holiday in favor of Stepan Bandera. Why would anybody who is opposed to Nazism take objection to that? Uh, let's be blunt. The Ukrainian parliament should never have declared a national holiday in favor of Stepan Bandera. Number two, uh, creating an educational program in the schools of Ukraine uh, to inform young people about the realities of Stepan Bandera and the party that he founded and its role in the Holocaust, uh, which is something along the lines of what we do nowadays. When I was growing up, I was uh, educated at Sir John A. Macdonald Public School. Nobody ever told me about the racism and white supremacy of uh, the former prime minister of Canada. Uh, now today, this is something that we think is appropriate to tell our children about. So why not ask that of a, our Ukrainian friends? Um, and finally, perhaps most importantly, dismantling the neo-Nazi battalions in the, Russia, in the Ukrainian military and disarming them. Again, why would anybody in the West object to that? I, I can't imagine for the life of me why we would think that's problematic. Again, this may or may not be acceptable to the Russians, but it's certainly something that we in the West I think should get behind, and there may be other ways to approach this difficult problem uh, that are principled and humane. Demand number six, the protection of the rights of Russian-speaking citizens, Russian language, and national minorities. We do that in this country. There's absolutely no reason why I wouldn't support that. But of course, this would have to be a reciprocal ob obligation, and the Russians would have to undertake to protect, uh, you know, with appropriate assur assurances and guarantees, the language rights and minority rights of Ukrainian speakers and other non-Russian speaking persons living under their jurisdiction after the conflict has been resolved. Number seven, free cross-border movement with Russia, uh, the lifting of anti-sanctions, uh, anti-Russia sanctions by Ukraine withdrawal of lawsuits. Uh, if you can get satisfaction on all of these other points, I can't see why we wouldn't want to reestablish trade with the Russian Federation, especially because uh, the economic health of Europe depends upon it. But even more importantly, Russia is an agricultural superpower. Last year, it became the largest exporter of wheat, for example. The global South desperately needs access to Russian agricultural products. It would be good for the global economy if we were able to lift these sanctions in a, in a principled way. And finally, demand number eight, the West must fund the reconstruction of the civilian infrastructure destroyed by Ukrainian forces after 2014. Uh, to me, this sounds like posturing. Uh, my own view about this is that the Russian Federation has to pony up a very, very large sum of money to help reconstruct Ukraine in the range of at least hundreds of billions of, of, of dollars. Uh, and it has the capacity to do that. And some may say there's no prospect of Russia doing that. I think you might be surprised, actually, if the Americans sat down and said, we're prepared to move those missile launchers uh, out of Romania, out of Poland, and withdraw NATO forces back to the Soviet era borders of NATO while continuing to give Article 5 protection to Eastern European countries like Poland and Romania, I suspect the Russians would be so attracted to that prospect because it's so important to their security that they'd be willing to pay a very significant financial price uh, in order to achieve that security. It would have to be, of course, embodied within an enforceable treaty. And this all brings me to my last point. Everything that I've said may or may not be within the realm of reality. But when you're confronted by a situation where you are heading towards nuclear war and the people you purport to protect are going to end up experiencing catastrophic suffering in what is almost certainly going to be a military defeat, why wouldn't you at least try? You know, they're running around and basically telling us in this country that it's an unpardonable sin to advocate for peace. The reality friends, is that it's an unpardonable sin not to try peace. So I thank you for your patience and listening to me, and I look forward to your questions.
Okay, thank you very much for that, Dimitri. That was uh, an amazing and moving presentation uh, for, for everything we went through. And, you know, I, I think something that's been coming up here in the, certainly in the Q&A is uh, what can we be doing about this at, an, at, a, uh, at a local level uh, in, in the cities and provinces and, and whatever in Canada? And uh, I think in a, a fairly simple answer to that is organize. Join peace organizations in your city. Uh, join peace organizations at the provincial level. Uh, you know, it's any of these things. And frankly, if you're not able to do that, educate yourself and others. Uh, don't buy the official story that we're being fed with this stuff. Look at some of the sources that have been provided tonight. Um, ask your friends, talk to your friends about it. Uh, you know, the list goes on and on. And uh, more to the point of that, I'm putting our GoFundMe just in the uh, chat here as well for everybody to see. Uh, if any of this has resonated with you, uh, please consider a donation as well to Kingston Peace Council. This money will uh, be used to offset the astronomical costs that have been incurred by the organizing committee for Dimitri's tour here. Uh, there is a real cost to censorship, you know, when you're looking to, to do something like this across Canada. It's booking multiple venues. It's uh, hiring security, uh, you know, insurance, what have you. Uh, on the Kingston Peace Council side of this, any donations you make, this is a donation to the peace movement in Canada, plain and simple. Uh, we hope to put on more events like this of this caliber in the future. Uh, this money will go to creating events at a more local level, as well as uh, feeding the homeless in our community as well. So if any of that's of interest to you, uh, I would ask that you consider that. Uh, now, with that said, I'd like to pass this over to uh, Brendan for the Q&A period here. I do see we have quite a few questions in the chat and uh, really looking forward to dialoguing with you folks. So thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, thanks very much, John. Thanks very much, Dimitri. And uh, we apologize for the uh, speech speaking segment of uh, Dimitri's talk went a bit over time there. Uh, normally, we would be scheduled to close the meeting normally at 10 o'clock p.m., but uh, we are able to extend it, of course, so we can deal with all of your questions. I know there had been up to about 230 people in the meeting, and um, we have a number of questions to get through. Um, one of the things we're going to be doing now, as promised, is opening up the chat very shortly, the uh, public chat. Um, and uh, the reason we had um, uh, made it so that that happens after Dimitri's speech is that it can be quite distracting to have the chat popping off with many hundreds of comments while Dimitri is making his presentation. So uh, we'll be opening that up shortly. Um, there are some rules of engagement for the uh, chat in particular. Um, First of all, yes, please, we encourage you to chime in with your name, location, upcoming events, and political affiliations. I know there's going to be multiple groups present that want to talk about what their activities are and what they're doing, so that's fine. Um, people want to, you know, say hello. And uh, we, we, we do have some requests as to how the discourse goes. Um, if you're going to be chatting about any subject, uh, we ask that the discourse be respectful primarily. Uh, we don't want to see sexist or racist or ableist or abusive or homophobic remarks uh, in the chat. Uh, we don't want to see ad hominem attacks against Dimitri, uh, people insulting him and insisting he is this or that. Uh, so uh, if people, uh, we, we ask you to follow the rules. If, if you don't, there are some people in the chat, co-hosts that are moderating and uh, they'll ask people to uh, stop violating the rules. And if they continue to violate rules, then uh, they will be asked to leave. So we hope that the chat will uh, be a venue for discussion about what we can do to bring Dimitri's message of peace to the Canadian public. I know there's some um, questions to that regard. But if the chat becomes a distraction to the meeting, we will uh, disable it. Um, but there are many questions in the Q&A section. And uh, I will be reading, uh, Dimitri, those questions. What I'm gonna try to do is alternate somewhat between uh, positive questions and hostile questions. And we'll, we'll try to get to everyone and we'll uh, follow it chronologically to some extent uh, and try to group questions together uh, for Dimitri. So um, for example, I mean, if, if Dimitri, if he's uh, ready to start on this, I, I think I have, yep, yeah, okay, a, a first question. Um, 
there is a questioner named um, M. Labudina who has asked about 11 questions in, in the Q&A. So I'm going to try to amalgamate uh, some of them. Um, so uh, this person asks Dimitri, why do you call it the Ukraine war and not the Russo-Ukraine war? Using uh, Ukraine war falsely alludes to the, the idea of Vietnam or Iraq war, and yet the situation is different than 40 years ago. The United States is an ally asked to step in by an officially elected government, is it not? And also, the USA is a guarantor of Ukraine's sovereignty under the 1994 Budapest Memorandum when Ukraine was forced by the Clintons to surrender its world's third largest nuclear arsenal. So um, that's the question uh, from M. Labudina. Okay, so well, there was some stuff in there that I don't necessarily agree with, but I, I've heard this before. Uh, the first time I actually heard the criticism that I used the phrase the Ukraine war was from someone who used to get along with me, but thinks that I've gone off the deep end. Uh, and I found that remark to be perfectly candid about it, rather surprising, this problem that people, some people explain that they have with my using this phrase, the Ukraine war. Uh, because the only reason why I use the phrase the Ukraine war is because the war is happening almost entirely on the territory of Ukraine. That's the only, there's nothing, there's no hidden agenda here. And when I first heard this from, um, you know, a friend of my mutual friend of my former friend, I did some quick research and I went to the first thing I did was I went to the website of the Guardian. Uh, I don't know about you, but the Guardian is about as pro Ukraine a newspaper as you could possibly imagine. The editors of The Guardian and the reporters of The Guardian, by all any rational analysis, absolutely loathe the Russian government. They use that phrase all the time. Nobody complains about it when pro-Ukrainian newspapers do that. I see this all the time. In terms of the phrase, you know, the Russian-Ukraine war, I have no problem using that. I really don't. I mean, I'm happy to do that if that doesn't, if that, th that would be less offensive to people who disagree with me. I'm not trying to offend anybody, but I'm using a designation that's based purely upon the geographic reality of the war and that is used widely in the Western pro-Ukraine media. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Dimitri. Um, the next question is from Gabriel or Gabe H. And the question is, for both Mr. Lascaris and the organizers, what are the main ways that we can develop from small local or regional peace groups towards a strong democratic anti-war movement? I'm sorry, this is a question for both the organizers and me? Well, I mean, questions are mainly directed at you. Organizers can answer in the chat, but uh, Dimitri, if, if you had any thoughts on how to develop uh, towards a, a national anti-war movement. Uh, you know, well, first of all, these the events are absolutely critical. Uh, what we're doing here today is having discussions about what peace may look like and what the realities of this war are. We're not going to generate a movement against this war unless we correct the record about the causes of the war and, even more importantly, the ultimate objectives of the West who are escalating this war, as Russia is doing. It's We're on a tra trajectory towards nuclear war, as the majority of the Canadian population now acknowledges. And we need to have conversations about how we got here and where this is all heading, as difficult as it may be. But the other thing I would go, I would say is that I found in the anti-war movement in Canada a high level of fragmentation. So there's wonderful people in communities around the country in small groups acting independently of each other uh, and not using their collective resources in the most efficient and effective manner possible by uniting uh, into one organization. So I, I would strongly argue i mean of course activism at the local level and you know some degree of independence for every local peace group is important but we should strive to uh uh to combine our intellectual and financial resources and you know human resources to the greatest possible degree uh so that we have a coordinated anti-war movement and a good place to start would be to you know have national days of action demanding that this war be brought to an end by being by means of negotiation, not just doing it locally, but having one big 
uh, protest and then building upon that and having more protests on a national level demanding negotiation. Okay, Dimitri, well, you're doing well because uh, I, we just got like 20 more questions, at, which we'll get to not too long from now. Um, one of the earlier questions is from Stefan K, who has asked a couple of questions. Um, he says, Dimitri, on February 2nd, 2022, you tweeted a news story about the White House saying after months of White House warmongering, Russia's dreaded invasion is no longer imminent. On February 16, you tweeted a story about how the Russian foreign ministry was mocking the idea of no invasion. Do you admit to having been shocked when Russia invaded Ukraine? Do you admit that the Russian state has been willfully unpredictable with respect to its military policies? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say I was shocked. I was surprised. Damn right I was surprised. And there's lots of people who were surprised. You know, uh, uh, there were people who are I, you know, one person for whom I respect a great deal and who came from the CIA, um, uh, Ray McGovern. You know, I heard before, um, it was about three weeks before the invasion, a debate between Ray McGovern and Scott Ritter, uh, a very heated debate in which Ritter was absolutely adamant that the Russians were going to destroy Ukraine if uh, we didn't start addressing some of their concerns. And Ray McGovern is, oh, no, this is all nonsense. He's He's not going to do it. I happen to be persuaded by McGovern's arguments. Yeah, it was wrong. You know, is it unpredictable? I don't know if I would say it was unpredictable, uh, but I certainly, based upon what I was hearing from, you know, intelligence experts, uh, was surprised. Okay, uh, recent uh, question from Sen Z, and that is, can you summarize your Canada-wide tour in short, uh, such as how many people attended your tour totally? Are you satisfied with the Canadians' response to your tour? Um, uh, I, I would think, I think under, look, obviously when you do a tour, you want thousands of people to show up so you can have a maximum impact. Uh, that wasn't realistic for a whole bunch of reasons, including that we didn't have the resources to get venues that big. And we didn't have the resources to publicize things. We couldn't buy advertisement. And also we got completely and utterly blackballed by the mainstream media. We sent out numerous press releases, you know, independent media with very small audiences paid close attention, but the mainstream media wanted nothing to do with the tour. So when I look at the obstacles we had to confront, including the deplatforming, we had to take ex extensive measures to protect the identities of the venues until the last possible minute, which really hindered our ability to, you know, bring people out. I think the result was fantastic. You know, we filled up or came close to filling up every single venue. Um, and there were only two or three incidents in which, uh, I mean, I, I, there were, you know, a number, a number of occasions where people who identified as Ukrainian and who strongly objected to my view came in and we had uh spirited exchanges and sometimes they became heated but never did it get out of control uh in hamilton as brendan knows we actually had people standing there waving flags uh, ukrainian flags and making some noise but some of them came in and uh in the q a uh actually managed to have uh you know respectful uh dialogue with me so i, I in every respect i'm not just saying this to you know uh to to, to convince you that this uh, a failed tour was in fact a success. I really feel in the, uh, with, uh, with the greatest of sincerity that this went far better than I would have expected at every venue, at every single venue. There was much less hostility than I anticipated, much better turnout than I anticipated. And even amongst our brothers and sisters in the Ukrainian community who disagree with me, there was more often than not respectful dialogue. You know, there's a related question to that uh, from, from Tim K. He said, how do we get beyond the sectarianism that has led to the earlier previous collapse of the anti-war movement that used to exist here and allow us to rebuild it on a non-sectarian basis to provide context? The previous Umbrella Peace Organization in Canada disintegrated uh, over disagreements around the war in Syria and various groups are not organizing with one another. So how do we, uh, how do we rebuild? You know, I, I, I don't, I get, a, I get a lot of questions like this in these Q and A's, like how do we make the anti-war movement more effective? How do we unite the anti-war movement? Um, 
all I can do at the end of the day, I, I don't have any magic answers other than the one that I've already offered you. And, you know, the only other thing I'll add to that is that I'm really trying to lead by example. Um, I'm very privileged to be in a position where I don't have to worry about the reputational consequences or the economic consequences of what I'm doing. Uh, because I had a very good career as a lawyer. Uh, I effectively retired from, you know, the for-profit practice of law. I still do a little bit of that, but uh, very sporadically. I effectively retired from that at 52, uh, you know, with a financial security. If I never made a dollar from the practice of law again, uh, you know, barring as long as I don't suffer some kind of economic catastrophe that's unforeseeable, uh, I'll be fine. I'll be comfortable. So I don't have to worry about that. Uh, I don't have to worry about people, although I hate it. It's very stressful. Uh, I don't have to worry about people smearing me uh, because at the end of the day, you know, I'll be secure financially and so will my family. Um, so those of us who are in this position, and there are not many of us who are in this position, we have to lead by example. You know, we have to go out there. We got to take the flack as awful as it is. Uh, because again, I cannot stress this enough. Uh, we are on the path to nuclear war, ladies and gentlemen. Over 50% of Canadians now get that. And this is an environment in which we're being misled about the war and the dangers of this war. So it's probably a lot more dangerous than that. Those of us who can lead by example must do it. Um, yeah, so there's a question from Gabe H. And he says, I agree. I agree that this is a U.S. provoked proxy war. However, the argument that Ukraine should not continue to fight because it is outmatched by Russia resembles a might makes right argument. Is this not a poor argument for a democratic anti-war movement to make if we were to apply the same logic to the colonial war in Palestine? Uh, you know, you, you, you could see you could argue that surrender is the best for Palestine. Uh, so I, I don't think this is a democratic position to take. Well, let, let me be very clear that my position with respect to Palestine is 100 percent consistent. I've never, ever advocated for us to send weapons to Palestinians because I think that that would result in a bloodbath. Oh, yeah, we could arm them so that they could kill a lot more Israeli soldiers. No doubt about it. But Israel will bring every single weapon it has to bear, and it happens to have nukes uh, to defeat the Palestinian people, and there will be a massacre. We have to find nonviolent methods of resolving the war. So the first thing I would say to you about, you know, uh, this whole notion of capitulation is, you know, as people like MLK taught us and Gandhi taught us, taught us there are ways to overcome oppression that are nonviolent. You know, we seem to have forgotten that. Uh, and the second thing is, this isn't simply a question of might versus right. We have to take into account that the Russians have some legitimate complaints. It's just not true that they decided one day they woke up and said, hey, we like those resources over there. We're going to steal them by brute force. We want that land. We want that oil. We want that water. They actually had legitimate arguments as to why the West and Ukraine should make some compromises. And we refused. We were absolutely adamant. The Russians went forward with a security, a new security architecture in late 2021. They presented it to the Biden administration, which frankly, based upon my understanding of it, would have increased the security of all of us because it would have moved nuclear missile launchers away from the Russian Federation. Okay. And what did they do? They told them, piss off. We don't want to talk to you. Ukraine, uh, membership of Ukraine and NATO, forget about it. They're going to become a member of Ukraine, whether you like it or not. We're going to shove it down your throat. You, you don't like us building up the Ukrainian military forces so they become a threat to people you think you have an obligation to protect? Too bad. Okay, there are real issues here. It's not purely a case of might versus right. And once we recognize that and sit down at the negotiating table with the Russians, we may find out that there's common ground, which is going to bring an end to the bloodshed and bring an end to the territorial loss for Ukraine. And maybe down the road, if we can get to that point, maybe down the road, there will be reconciliation and there will be reintegration of these populations together. But our priority has to be to stop the killing, especially to defuse the nuclear war potential. Well, here's a short question on that basis. It's from Glenn G. He says, how could we expect Russia to go along with any treaty arrangements after the Minsk agreement's betrayal? 
uh, I don't know. I tell you, I don't, I really don't know. Like if I were the Russians, I mean, you know, just for the, the benefit of people who may not be aware of this, I didn't really talk about it because, you know, my presentation's long enough, but, you know, there were agreements put in place called the Minsk Accords in which, um, you know, the, 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 the belligerents in the civil war agreed th that there wasn't going to be separation, that these areas of the country were not going to become independent of Ukraine. What they wanted was a degree of autonomy and partic particularly the protection of their language rights. And uh, the Ukrainian government, uh, I believe it was Poroshenko, committed to this. And then recently, uh, he and Angela Merkel and uh, Francois Hollande, who was the French president at the time, and others, you know, effectively acknowledged that this was all a ruse. And that the reason why they did this was they wanted to buy time to build up the Ukrainian military forces. Um, and so this has created a massive problem of trust. Uh, the best answer I can give you, this is a really big problem in terms of solving this by means of negotiation, is that um, we need to throw the bums out. You know, we need to throw the bums out. The people who are currently in power have lost all credibility. And believe me, my friends, it's not just with the Russian Federation. Our governments are despised in the global south. They're viewed as clowns. They don't know what they're doing. They're incompetent. They're completely untrustworthy. They have massive egos, incredible amounts of hubris. There's a growing recognition in the West, I mean, in the non-Western world, that the West is very, very poorly governed. We need to throw these bums out and put people in power who at least can be trusted to keep their word in their dealing with foreign nations, not just Russia, all foreign nations. Okay, thanks, Dimitri. Uh let you have a drink of water there. Um, we got two questions from uh, Jerry Heil. Um, and uh, the first one is, do you know Russia is threatening to blow up the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant today? Uh, and his other question is, uh, it's down below, just give me a moment. Uh, his other question is, how can you be anti-war if you think Russia should be rewarded for its war crimes. So uh, I don't know what you're talking about, my friend. Uh, I have not, I, I, I follow, uh, I know it's not supposed to be done, but I actually follow Russian telegram channels. Uh, I want to know what they're saying. And I, I try to be, you know, circumspect about what I'm reading and take it with a grain of salt. And again, as I said, test it against the available evidence. But I've not seen anything like that, a threat to blow up the Zaporizhia. I've seen all kinds of nonsense written in the Western media about this. You know, they said, and let me remind you, that it was the Russian Federation that blew up Nord Stream. And you can do the research yourself, and you'll find out that now all major Western governments acknowledge that it wasn't Russia. But they said it was Russia. Uh, and they're saying this now. In fact, if you look at the record, the available evidence, which is not conclusive, it appears that what has happened is that the Ukrainians were selling, shelling the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant, and the Ukrainians, because they're losing this offensive horribly, and they're desperate, might actually try to uh, stage a false flag in order to draw NATO into a direct military conflict on their side uh, to avoid catastrophe. I don't, I'm not telling you that's what's going to happen. But that seems to me like a significantly more plausible scenario than the Russians are going to blow up a nuclear power plant that they plant that they themselves control. You know, and I remind you, they did the same thing in Nord Stream. They said it's Russia, 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 and now they're admitting it wasn't Russia. Uh, I, I'm sorry. The the second question now uh, I've escapes me. Could you remind me, Brendan, what the second question the gentleman? It, it was something about. Um... Oh yeah, how how can you be anti-war if you think Russia should be rewarded for its war crimes? Yeah, but I don't think that. I never said Russia should be rewarded for its war crimes. I mean, you know, what I'm trying to do is stop the killing and avoid a nuclear war. I mean, you're looking at it as a, a, an objective of rewarding somebody for wrongdoing. No, that's not my objective at all. Uh, and secondly, if we're so concerned about war crimes in the West, then why aren't we holding Bush accountable? Why aren't we holding Condoleezza Rice accountable? Why aren't we holding Benjamin Netanyahu accountable? I mean, we have absolutely no credibility when we say, oh, oh, these people are going to be rewarded for their war crimes. We do this every day in the West. Come on. I mean, seriously, let's focus on stopping the killing and then let's concern ourselves with accountability. And the last thing I want to say about this is 
a lot of the stuff that's said about Russian war crimes, and I have no doubt that Russia's, some Russian forces have committed war crimes, because that's in the nature of war. War makes monsters out of men, especially war this destructive. It's inevitable feature of war. So that also means, and there's plenty of evidence to support this, that Ukrainian forces have committed war crimes. Amnesty International has put out reports. Human Rights Watch just put out a report, I think within the last week, that the Ukrainian forces, they believe, have been using these, uh, these pedal mines, which are extremely dangerous to civilians and which have been known to cause the deaths of children because they resemble little toys and children will pick them up and get blown up. Uh, and this is just an example. The Western media doesn't talk about this. I think that this whole notion of holding people accountable is very important, but we have to do it universally, including when it involves our own citizens and our own allies, number one. And number two, our, our, our quest for accountability, as important as it is, should not become an obstacle to our quest to stop the killing and avoid a nuclear holocaust. That should be the first priority. Okay, uh, there's a question here from Gail. Uh, it is, have, have you thought of approaching a member of parliament or United States representative that may be sympathetic and pen a letter to Putin with your proposals? Um, well, it's hard, hard I, I, I actually am uh, in discussions with people in the United States, political figures, they're not elected. I had a, I've had a couple of very interesting conversations with Jill Stein, uh, the former leader of the U.S. Green Party. Um, I have, uh, uh, I, I, I hope to be assisting in any way that I can the campaign of Cornell West. Uh, that's one of the things I've been talking to Jill Stein about. Uh, by the way, Cornell West, who's an amazing human being, is saying essentially what I'm saying. Uh, and has said it more eloquently than I ever could. Uh, so there are people in the United States, uh, very few of them actually in positions of power, but people who could become uh, politically important in the future who want to have these discussions, and I am trying to speak to them. Uh, you know, I think in terms of sending a letter to Putin, I mean, you know, I've done everything I can to make my position known to the government of the Russian Federation, including meeting with people uh, in the, the Ministry of the uh, Foreign Affairs in, in, in Moscow. Uh, so... And, and I've appeared on, although it's considered to be, you know, unspeakably awful, I've actually appeared on RT because I know that there are people who are pro-Russian and Russian who watch that network. And I've tried to describe, to explain to them the extraordinary danger that we're in and how it's possible to have conversations, reasonable and respectful conversations with people in the West, that there are people like us out there who want to have those conversations. Thanks, Dimitri. By the way, I'd remind people the... Uh... The Toronto event, of course, is going ahead for July 8th. It was previously deplatformed, but it's going ahead for July 8th. Uh, details are going to be posted on the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War website at hcsw.ca. That's hcsw.ca. Uh, it'll be on the uh, Canada-wide Peace and Justice Network as well. Uh, so keep keep an eye open for that. Toronto area, people should go out to that. Um, now, uh, there's a couple questions here from Lynn Adamson, I'm going to uh, amalgamate them. Uh, first is, uh, are you critical of Russia for their invasion and brutal attacks? Or do you think the damage and deaths in Ukraine is made up? Looks pretty brutal to me. Did Russia have an alternative to invasion? Uh, and, and similarly, uh, have you considered visiting uh, Kiev or other ways to learn about the Ukrainian perspective? Uh, I think, there was, uh, first of all, let me say, I think there's been a lot more death than we're being told, particularly on the Ukrainian side. Uh, I think the casualties are being understated. I think both sides are understating their casualties, but I imagine because of this gigantic advantage that Russia has in artillery, uh, I just I just find the Ukrainian casualty numbers fantastical. I can't see how they could have so few casualties when they have such a huge disadvantage in artillery and also air power. Uh, you know, Russia has almost achieved air superiority and has the world's second largest air force. So I think it's actually bloodier and more awful. And I'm gonna tell you, I've forced myself to watch videos. Battlefield videos, the most gruesome, awful, terrible thing you can imagine, because I'm trying to get a sense of what has actually happened at Battlefield. I just don't trust the mainstream media. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a level of destruction that is unimaginable. Unimaginable. The lethality of modern armies is well beyond anything that 
you know, we've seen in the history of warfare, uh, in part because of drones. Drone, these, this war, what really sets this war apart amongst other things from a military perspective is that both sides have massive quantities of drones, which is a lethality multiplier. It makes your weaponry and your munitions far more effective and efficient in killing people. So the death and destruction is terrible, absolutely terrible. Uh, I, I can't stress enough that this should, should want us all to bring it uh, to an end uh, as quickly as possible. And uh, I do believe that both sides have committed war crimes. I don't purport to know uh, which side has committed more. It's entirely possible it's been the Russians. I do believe that you know a lot of the stuff that's said is highly suspect. A lot of the claims that are made about some of these atrocities is suspect. The, the evidence is in there. And some of it just sounds implausible on its face. Uh, so I really don't know in the fog of war exactly how bad it is, but I have no doubt that there's war crimes been committed. I have no doubt that both sides have done it, that are going on this very minute, and that this war is far more destructive than we are being told. Great. Uh, yes, very, very much so. So um, there is a question here from Kevin Niche, and he was asking, could you tell us about oh, the- Sorry, can sorry the Brendan. There was a, I think there was a question in there about going to Ukraine. Am I correct? Oh yes, that's that's right. Yes. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. I wanted to answer that question. Um, so, uh, first of all, <laughs> based upon what has happened on this trip, I don't feel particularly comfortable with the idea of going to Ukraine. <laughs> I can tell you right now. So, for example, there was somebody who appears to be affiliated with the Canadian media or Canadian military, I should say, uh, somebody who goes by the name of Carl Gravel. Uh, who put on the Twitter, there, there's a, I should step back so you know the context. There is a Ukrainian Canadian professor uh, at the uh, University of Victoria who has been berating me on Twitter. Uh, and she put out an article claiming that I went to some filtration camp where war crimes have been committed. This is complete nonsense. Uh, and somebody in reply to that tweet said that, uh, he had he he had heard from reliable sources that I was going to be assassinated in Victoria, and that tweet is sat on her Twitter account uh, for three weeks. She didn't delete it. As far as I know, she made no effort to bring it to my attention. I found out about this from the organizers of the Victoria event when I was in Victoria, and we went ahead and had the event anyways after notifying the police. So I don't really feel comfortable going to Ukraine, to be perfectly blunt about it. Um, but uh, you know. Putting that aside, if I did feel comfortable, uh, I would be happy to go, but it was not my priority on this trip to do that uh, because what I'm really trying to do is to introduce some balance into the public discourse. We are told every day about the awful things that the Russians are doing. Some of it is definitely true. Some of it is, may or may not be true. Some of it is complete BS. Uh, but whatever you believe about its veracity, we are hearing constantly from the Western media and our governments about the bad things Russians do. We don't hear about the other side of the ledger. And my priority at this stage of the whole discussion is to introduce some balance into the discussion and not simply repeat uh, the allegations of atrocities being made by Russia because we're getting that all the time. Uh, having said all that, if I feel secure and I can get into you know, the Ukrainian controlled parts of Ukraine, yeah, I would readily go there, absolutely. I, I can't hear you, uh, Brendan. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, the, the next question, I believe, was from Kevin Nish, and uh, he was saying, could you tell us about the canceling of some of your events? Uh, sure. So uh, the first cancellation was, uh, you know, the OPSU, Ontario Public Service Employees Union Headquarters in Toronto, excuse me, which was our third venue. The president herself, J.P. Hornick, uh, canceled the event about three or four hours before I was scheduled to speak. Uh, apparently, uh, the, the OPSU's leadership was inundated with hostile messages. Um, and uh, as I, I, would, I did not speak to her directly, I spoke to somebody else from OPSU who was relaying it to me, that, uh, they, she, that, that Ms. Hornick had become quite concerned about security. Uh, because of the nature and quantity of the message that she had received, and also because there were no security guards at the facility uh, in the evening when I was scheduled to speak. Um, later on, I found out um, 
uh, the, from just reviewing, when I got a moment to breathe on this trip, I was looking at some of the commentary on social media and following some of the, looking more closely at some of the people who have been really focused on derailing this tour. And I found that uh, copies of letters on Twitter that had been sent to Miss Hornick, uh, which just completely flat out lied about what I had said in London, Ontario. Just flat out lied. They put words in my mouth that I never spoke, not there, not anywhere. Uh, and one of these letters came from somebody who purported to be Russian. I don't know whether the person's a Russian or not, but I can tell you that what he said I said in London was a complete pack of lies. Unfortunately, I wasn't aware of this at the time when uh, OPSU canceled, so there was no way I could defend myself because I didn't actually see the communications. Um, uh, then the next thing that happened was Winnipeg. Again, uh, there's been a consistent pattern. Uh, you know, the Ukrainian Canadian Congress has been very heavily involved in this. Uh, as I, there's lots of reason to believe that other more local Ukrainian uh, organizations uh, who support Canadian government policy towards this war have been involved in this. The Ukrainian embassy has been involved in this. Uh, they've been pressuring uh, venues all over the country. So in Winnipeg, this succeeded in causing uh, our initial venue to cancel about 24 hours before I was to speak. Then the day of, there was another cancellation in our Plan B venue. And at that point, we were just like flailing and looking desperately for some place to hold this event because a lot of people wanted to come out. And we found, I didn't, but the local organizers found it. Uh, and it went off without a hitch. And virtually everybody who had planned to show up managed to show up. Um, then the next cancellation came in Halifax. Uh, there, uh, Professor Larry Haven, uh, and who was a professor emeritus of St. Mary's University uh, and a highly respected um, you know, human rights activist, uh, you know, has played a very significant role in independent Jewish voices. He was one of our local organizers, along with his partner, Judy Haven, also a professor emeritus at St. Mary's University. They reserved a room there. And within eight hours of reserving the room, Larry got a call from the St. Mary's University president, uh, whose name is, uh, I believe, Summerby, Summerby Davies, uh, Robert Summerby Davies. And he told him that he was canceling. He told Larry that he was canceling the event. And Larry, uh, you know, objected strenuously, pointing out that this was a question of freedom of speech, that a university should be an environment in which discussion about controversial and difficult subjects is fostered and the president of St. Mary's you know trotted out a complete pile of BS and said that he believed that I was being investigated for violating Canadian sanctions law. Uh, I know where he got this by the way I mean I don't know for a certainty but there's a clown who works at the McDonald Laurier Institute by the name of Marcus Kolga who was giving testimony in parliament uh, a few weeks ago and purely by accident a friend of mine discovered that he had said to parliamentarians that I had violated Canadian sanctions law. And I know that he has been heavily involved in applying pressure on venues uh, to cancel my events. So I think that the president of St. Mary's University regrettably simply bought what he was being told by this, you know, frothing at the mouth neocon propagandist Marcus Kolga, and never gave me an opportunity to respond. And I am, after all, a lawyer. Maybe I have something to say about whether I violated the law. Kolga is not a lawyer. But the St. Mary's president was prepared to rely upon him, presumably, because I don't know where else it came from. And let me just say, I've been back in Canada for months. Uh, I left Russia on April 30th. No one from the Canadian government or Canadian law enforcement has contacted me, questioned me, asked me the slightest question about what I was doing in Crimea uh, or mainland Russia. No one. So this is a pile of crap. Uh, so sorry to be crude about it, but that's how I feel. Uh, and so the last cancellation, um, was in Montreal, my own hometown, a venue there, uh, which is owned and managed by people that I've known personally for a few years. They know my politics. They know the position that I had taken on this war. Uh, they don't necessarily agree with everything that I say, but they think that it's a point of view uh, that deserves to be heard. Um, you know, they agreed to allow us to use uh, their venue and it's in my own neighborhood. I've been there numerous times. Um, and, uh, on the day that I was scheduled to speak at 11 a.m., we, we were very, very uh, secretive about the location because we wanted to protect his business. He's a friend of mine. And I didn't want to you know, involve him in any of this controversy. Somehow somebody at about 11 a.m. on the day that I was going to speak found out where this was going to be. And the first thing that happened is uh, a woman who identified herself as Ukrainian came down to his place of business and said, we're going to come here tonight with a huge crowd 
and we're going to make a stink and we're going to embarrass you. Uh, and then the next thing that happened was uh, they started getting emails and telephone calls, dozens and dozens of them. And somehow the people even found out who the owners were. Uh, they weren't just sending it to management. Then they, they found the owners and started flooding them with emails and calls. Uh, then at three o'clock, uh, the owner got a call from CTV television in Montreal. And they said, we're going to come down there and uh, we are going to uh, videotape people who are going into this event. Uh, and even then, the owner said to me, look, I gave you my word. I'm going to stand my ground. Uh, but the last straw was around 4.30. Uh, the owner saw that they were getting a huge number of negative reviews online about their business. Uh, and this is a very well-respected business. It's you know built up a good reputation with his clientele over a number of years. Um, and they were getting one-star ratings from all sorts of people. And a lot of the people they were getting these one-star ratings from identified as being in Ukraine. So they don't even live in Canada. Uh, and at that point, he called me up. He said, "Look, man, I'm so sorry, but like this is this is the last straw. We just can't do this. You know, this is going to be severely damaging to my business." So we 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 uh, managed to get everybody, and we were sold out that night. We had more registration registrations than seats. Uh, so we took it out into a park, which was two blocks away from the venue in Old Montreal. Uh, I spoke for about 45 minutes. Obviously, I couldn't do my PowerPoint. Um, and then we had a Q&A. And the whole time that I was there, there were about 20 uh, protesters waving Ukrainian flags uh, who were so close that I had to shout to be heard. And they kept saying over and over again that I was a fraud, a liar, and a fascist. Um, and nonetheless, I think we had a very good discussion. Uh, and um, uh, I really admire the people of Montreal for coming out, <laughs> the, the activist community and, and continuing to engage about this difficult topic in those circumstances, because it wasn't easy. Yes, uh, and I believe that's only the half of it of, in terms of the deplatforming attempts. Maybe we'll learn more about that later. Uh, Brendan here from Hamilton, uh, just as a reminder, um, I noticed that Jason Baines has posted information in the webinar chat uh, about Toronto tickets for Dimitri's Toronto meeting. So uh, uh, people can click on that link and uh, sign up for the Toronto meeting uh, in a few days from now. Um, with reference to the deplatforming attempts, of course, that basically tripled the cost of a number of the uh, venues involved. Uh, Dimitri is out of pocket on some severe expenses now. Um, uh, so I know John has been posting information about fundraising. Uh, certainly these extraordinary expenses uh, from a very deliberate campaign of deplatforming involving uh, foreign actors and um, various organizations centrally in Canada. Uh, if you want to help out with Dimitri there, uh, uh, go talk to John, message him, look at his posts about fundraising. Uh, the, the fundraising will be pushed forward to the Toronto event, which has incurred extraordinary expenses as well as uh, Ottawa. Um, also, you'll see that Tamara Lawrence has um, indicated there's an upcoming anti-NATO protest worldwide coming up and you can get the details from her postings. I think it starts July 8 or 9 or around that time here in Canada. Uh, so uh, take a look at that. Um, we have a relatively short question from Jose, uh, who says, thank you, Dimitri. How do you think your interventions on political officials has changed over time since before the invasion to the present? Um. Uh, well, I'm not sure if the question is directed at uh, what I've been doing in those disruptions or what the effect of the disruptions has been. I, I think uh, Jose's question is sounds like it's uh, focused on the former. So, uh, what I how my uh, interventions have changed. Uh, my interventions have become uh, entirely focused on this war. Uh, I say it again, like, I mean, there's nothing more important right now. If you're an activist, there's nothing more important right now than stopping this war. Uh, I can't repeat it enough. Over 53% of Canadians believe that we're headed towards a nuclear war. The climate crisis doesn't really matter at this stage because we may not survive the next six months. Okay. I'm, I'm not particularly focused right now on what's going to happen in 10 or 15 or 20 years. Of course, this is an existential threat, the climate crisis, but we may not get through six months, people. So this is like, this, should, this is everything. If you're an activist, whatever your cause may be, uh, you should put that cause, just put it aside for a second and devote, if not all of your time as an activist, 
a substantial part of your time as an activist to demanding a negotiated peace. Nothing is more important than that right now. And that's what my disruptions have become completely focused upon for the last 18 months. Well, a uh, question uh, from Emil. Uh, Dimitri, are you surprised that you have not yet made it on the Ukraine kill list? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, first of all, I'm not entirely sure I'm not on it because I haven't checked recently. <laughs> but um, I think just looking at the thing, I've, I, by the way, I've seen people on, uh, a lot of people on Twitter have said, you know, I should be added to it. Um, but I think they tend to focus on people who have a lot more uh, profile than I do. Uh, you know, so like people like Jeffrey Sachs, who's obviously far better known than I am or ever will be. Uh, you know, th these types of people are more of a concern to them than uh, uh, a more uh, obscure figure like myself. Um, question from W. Cooley. Um, to what extent are negotiations being blocked by the United States and NATO rather than Ukraine's unwillingness to bargain? It seems like Ukraine has been open to negotiations. Zelensky wanted to meet Xi Jinping in China after China released its peace proposal, and Bennett claimed he was facilitating negotiations that were blocked by the West. So is it the U.S. that's holding Ukraine back from negotiations, or is it more complicated than that? It's, it's, it's a very good question, very important question. It's hard to say, obviously. Uh, you know, there's so much going on behind the scenes that we don't know and we'll never know. Uh, but uh, I, I'm going to go back to what I said uh, at the point of my presentation where I was talking about the true motivations of the United States. Because the true motivation of the United States is not to save Ukraine, but to weaken and, if possible, defeat Russia, um, it just logically follows from that that the United States is going to want this war to go on as, for, as, for as long as possible and to provide as much capacity to the Ukrainians to kill uh, as many Russians as possible and destroy as much uh, Russian military material and infrastructure as possible. I mean, it's just logical. If your goal is not to save a country, but to destroy another, uh, you're just going to do whatever is necessary to prolong the war that is being waged against that, that country. Uh, and so I think that uh, the U.S. has zero interest, given its agenda, in seeing peace. Absolutely none. It's going to do everything it can to prolong this war, unless and until we throw the bums out, frankly. You know? And this is the thing I find so disgusting and depraved and horrible about this war. It's said all the time, but it's true. It's true. We are using the Ukrainian people as cannon fodder. That's what this is about. This is going to end in their destruction, and ain't nobody in the White House give a damn about that. Uh, question on that uh, from uh, David S. He says, hi, Dimitri. I have a question about Canadians who want to also engage in citizen diplomacy of our own. You've mentioned that Regis Tremblay helped you on your trip. Are there other Westerners and contacts people interested in citizen diplomacy should be seeking? Uh Westerners in in Russia, I assume. Uh, uh, well, one person who comes to mind, although he's a journalist, I actually had uh, lunch with him in Moscow, uh, is Fred Weir. Um, Fred is a very interesting fellow. He's a Canadian who uh, was writing for a communist, he's a journalist, and he was writing for a communist newspaper in Canada, I believe it was called The Tribune, back in the 70s and early 80s. And then he 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 moved to Russia as a journalist in the late 80s, uh, before the collapse of the Soviet Union, and has stayed there ever since. Uh, and he married a Russian woman, and he has a child who was born in Russia and speaks fluent English and Russian. And uh, Fred writes articles. He now writes principally for the Christian Science Monitor. He's one of the last uh, Western con uh, correspondents uh, in Russia. Uh, he writes articles which are quite critical of the Putin government, by the way. Uh, but he also uh, is one of the people who helped me to understand that I didn't mention my presentation, but it, he was—he really did help me to understand that there's a lot more to this picture than meets the eye. Like one story he told me, even though he's been very critical of the Russian government, especially in regard to free speech, 
um, is that uh, his son, he sent his son to attend college in Canada. And at the moment when I met with him, he told me my son's feeling homesick and wants to come back to Russia. And I said, why? And he said, because he had a need to consult a doctor and uh, you know he couldn't find a, a doctor to treat him in the time frame that he needed. And this just wouldn't happen to him in Russia. Um, this is coming from a father who's a journalist who's very critical of the government, by the way. Uh, so um, Fred is the kind of guy who could really, I think, help. I, I shouldn't volunteer his services because I have no idea how he feels about this. But if you want to get a, a nuanced picture of Russia and start a dialogue with somebody over there who speaks fluent English and understands our country very well, you may want to reach out to him. Uh, Regis Tremblay is another such person. Uh, there are two people I met with, I was there, um, who I don't believe they're going to be based in Russia, but I think they visit regularly. One is Rick Sterling, who is a Canadian-American human rights activist who lives on the West Coast. And the other one is uh, Dan Kovalik, uh, who was a law professor, uh, I believe, at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, they traveled, actually, they did the same trip that I did. They went from Moscow all the way down to Crimea by train and went back to Moscow. I think they're they made a lot of contacts. I think they're easily reachable. You can find them on the internet. Um, they made a lot of contacts with Russians who want to have a dialogue. Uh, so they they might be some good people to help. Again, I'm not volunteering their services. I don't know if they have the time to help with that, but I I suspect that they uh, they 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 will be willing to do something to help. Yes, thank you, Dimitri. Rick Sterling was on the Taylor Report last month. He uh, gave testimony to his visit to Russia along with Dan Kovalik, where they wrote several articles for United States publications. Um, and uh, it's being indicated in the chat that uh, Kingston has hosted Dan Kovalik uh, in the past. Um, I hope you're not too tired. Let me know if you're getting tired. Um, we, we have a question from Roger C. He says, why is there such a disconnect between all Canadian political parties on both Ukraine and China in Canada's parliament? To me, they seem all to have been involved in shameful conduct. They all seem to be singing from the same hymn book, whether from Quebec or Canada. Uh, you know, don't get me started on the Canadian political class because I got nothing good to say. I just got nothing good to say. I find it absolutely appalling that there is not a single MP, not one. And if anybody knows of one, please correct me, because uh, I'd love to be proven wrong about this. But as far as I know, not one is willing to speak out publicly against sending weapons to Ukraine uh, and demand that we uh, confine our assistance to purely humanitarian forms of assistance. They're all, as you said, singing from the same script. And uh, why are they doing this? Um, I, I think there's a variety of reasons. One of them is, you know, you do need to generate money to be a viable candidate. And the people who have money in this country predominantly want this war. Uh, they, they support the Canadian government foreign policy. A lot of these people, uh, you know, profit directly or indirectly from Canadian government's militaristic foreign policy. And so, you know, you pay the piper. Uh, you want to get money from these people to help finance your campaigns. You have to support policies that they support. That's one factor. Uh, another factor is a lot of the people who end up in parliament are ideologically aligned with this policy. They are fundamentally neoconservative. Uh, and there's been a whole set of filters set up in our political system to, to enhance the prospects of people like that and diminish the prospects of people who disagree with them. And one of those filters is, of course, the mainstream media. As I mentioned, this tour has gotten zero attention from the mainstream media, only from independent media outlets that have very small audiences. Uh, but if you are a proponent of this war and you think we should escalate it, oh, the mainstream media is only too happy to stick a microphone in your mouth. You know, So you end up with people in parliament because they're being promoted by the media, the ones that have the large audiences, uh, in preference to people who are peace activists, true peace activists. Uh, so, And I think another factor I think this is a big one, is just sheer cowardice, sheer moral cowardice. There are a lot of people in Parliament who are just afraid of having to have their names dragged through the mud. And I 
believe me, I know it's an unpleasant experience. But, you know, I, I saw a recent conversation with Yanis Varoufakis, um, uh, who had the misfortune, you know, he was the former Greek finance minister, he's a leftist. Uh, he formed a small uh, left wing political party after his former party, Syriza, uh, betrayed a referendum in Greece in 2015 and imposed crushing austerity in the Greek people. He managed to actually get into parliament with his little political party. And then the most recent election, they lost their seats because they didn't hit the 3% threshold. And so he was interviewed and he said, uh, in that interview, he was asked about the, the defeat. And he said, you know, we on the left in politics, our primary responsibility is not to win. Our primary responsibility is to be right. Uh, and unfortunately, there are very few people on the left who think that way nowadays. They're so interested in winning that they are mortally fearful of being raked over the coals in the mainstream media. Okay, uh, question from Jason K. Uh, he says, you, you shared a photo where you visit a filtration camp in Crimea. According to the UN, filtration camps are camps used by Russian forces since the 2002 to register, interrogate, and detain Ukrainian citizens in regions under Russian occupation before transferring them into Russia, sometimes as part of forced population transfers. Were you questioned about that when you came back to Canada? Did you declare it at the border? I'm so glad Jason Keyes asked me this question. This man has been smearing me six ways from Sunday for months. I mean, literally, it's like a full-time job for this dude. Dude, don't you have anything better to do with your time than smear me? I mean, seriously? Uh, let me answer your question directly, sir. Okay, this so-called filtration camp, you do not have an iota of evidence to back up this ridiculous claim that you're making. I went to this camp and personally inspected every tent in the camp. It was a little camp. It was maybe three or four tents. I spoke to every single worker at the camp. Uh, there was nobody carrying a weapon. I didn't see anybody in detention. I didn't see anybody being mistreated. There were only three people at the camp when I was there and I talked about them in my presentation. It was a couple and a 10 year old daughter. And the man told me he wanted to go to Poland and that these people were helping him to get there. He didn't wanna to go to the East. He didn't wanna to go to Russia. He wanted to go to Poland, which is now the mortal enemy of Russia. And he told me himself, the people were helping him to get there. So. Where do you get this idea? Because you read some article in the New Yorker magazine that Tamara Krachenko posted on her, uh, on her Twitter feed that this is a filtration camp. You have no basis to say that whatsoever. In fact, virtually everything you say about me on Twitter, sir, is a complete and bald-faced lie, which has no basis in fact. And thank you for affording to me the opportunity to tell you this to your face. Okay, well, thank you. You're welcome, Dimitri. Um, a question from Emily D. Uh, because U.S. foreign policy is controlled by the military industrial complex, what would bring the United States to a negotiating table? <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it's real hard to see how the this 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 cabal of warmongers in the White House can be. Uh, forced to conduct themselves in a reasonable manner. I mean, this crew, Victoria Newland and Jake Sullivan and Anthony Blinken and uh, Mark Milley and worst of all, Joe Biden. I mean, these people are nuts. I mean, I, I don't know. I can't put it to you in any kind of a scientific manner. They're bonkers. Uh, I think the best hope we have, if, if we're going to get a peace deal with the current crew of Western leaders that we have, the best hope we have, and it's not much of a hope, is I think Germany and France finally saying uncle. France right now is going up in flames. Uh, you know, Germany's economy is going in the tank. Uh, there's a lot of people out there who are getting really worked up about uh, the decline in the quality of life in Europe. Uh, they're becoming increasingly alarmed at the escalation of this war. They don't see Ukraine making dramatic battlefield gains, uh, despite claims by the mainstream media to the contrary. And I think that if the German and French leaders, for whom I have zero respect, frankly, can somehow manage the courage to tell Biden that they're no longer going to go along with this proxy war, at that point, Biden may be forced to finally uh, try to limit the losses in this, uh, this cat catastrophe. But I think that if, you know, 
the, the, the more influential allies of the United States continue to slavishly follow the White House's policies with respect to this war, uh, it's very, very difficult to see a, a, a resolution that doesn't end in the destruction of Ukraine and possibly the destruction of us all. Okay, a uh, question from Martin C. Uh, given that Ukrainians are likely to be the biggest losers of the conflict overall, could I ask you to speculate on the motivation of the deplatformers and so on who protest your talks and your right to speak freely? Do you think it is because they have been misled by the West and Ukraine's misinformation, or is it for other reasons? Uh, I think there's a variety of reasons. It depends on who you're talking about. There are a lot of people who are coming after me who genuinely believe in what they're saying. Uh, and I, again, I, I'm sorry for having to be so blunt about it, but a lot of these people have just been straight up brainwashed. And I can't really blame them uh, in a sense because we do have an extraordinarily powerful and effective propaganda system in the West. Uh, in particular in the United States. And we're basically more or less, you know, because of our geographic proximity uh, and the integration of our economy with the United States, we're more or less subjected to the same propagandistic influences as the American people. And it's really, really an effective system. And there are days when I step back from, I, I sort of force myself to distance myself from all the stuff that's being said about me and kind of marvel at it and just behold in its glorious splendor the genius of this propaganda system and how it's made people who are normally very thoughtful people, well-meaning people, uh, into useful idiots of the Anglo-American empire, just blubbering useful idiots of the empire. Uh, it's amazing to behold. Uh, so those people, uh, and I, I still feel affection for them, even though they're saying these things about me and they're saying, I can't believe I ever supported you and all the rest of it, because I just feel that they have become they fall in victim this victim this extremely effective propaganda system, but fundamentally they mean well. And then there's a whole other group of people out there uh, who are just profiteers, people like Marcus Kolga, uh, people you know J. C. Boucher at the University of Calgary, uh, uh, you know uh, Dominic Cardi, uh, who's again somebody. This guy used to be the education minister in New Brunswick, and now he sits as an independent in New Brunswick legislature. He's just been going hog wild on me uh, and showed up at the event in Fredericton. It was quite insulting. In fact, this guy, uh, when he showed, this is, a, this is a guy who was the education minister recently in New Brunswick, sitting in the legislature. He shows up at our event in Fredericton and Rowan Miller, our host, 25 year old recent graduate with a master's of political science, puts out his hand to shake that of Don McCarty and he refuses. And he says, I never shake the hand of Kremlin scum. OK, this man's like, I don't know what to say that I have no goodwill towards that. He, and, he, and then he refused to shake my hand. Uh, and so there are people out there who are just sort of like extreme ideologues and they're profiteers directly or indirectly. They're being funded by the Defense Ministry of Canada or by the U.S. State Department or by military industrial corporations. Uh, and they don't really give a damn about what's right or wrong. They just want to enrich themselves. Uh, I'm not saying, by the way, that Dominic Cardi is in the enrichment category, because I said, as far as I know, he makes his living as a as a member of the legislature. But is he an, just a frothing at the mouth neocon ideologue? Yeah, 100 percent. OK, we're getting close to the time in which we had pushed uh, Zoom to max max out on this at around 11. Uh, we still have time for a couple of questions, I think. Uh, uh, we have one from um, Evan, who asks. What do you say to people who think Russia will invade more countries if an agreement with Ukraine is made that cedes the Donbass and Luhansk uh, regions? Is there much of an anti-war movement in Russia? Is there even political freedom for one? Well, th those are very distinct questions. Um, so uh, is there an anti-war movement in Russia? Well, uh, I didn't see any evidence of one. I'm sure there is one, by the way. Uh, but I did I, in the in the time that I was there, and in the places where I I was situated, I did not see uh, anti-war, pro-peace protests, and nobody said to me, um, you know, we got to stop this war now. Uh, there are, there's a lot of concern, uh, and if you look at polls, there was a poll that came out uh, recently. Uh, it was it was Levada again. It was in an article. It's discussed in an article by John Helmer on his website. 
Um, and it shows that uh, approximately, uh, I, I can't remember the exact number, but it's it's somewhere in the range of like 48% of Russians think the war has to be taken to its conclusion. In other words, they don't want it to stop. They want to see Ukraine completely defeated. And the number of people who wanted the country to enter into peace negotiations now is about 45%. Now, there's these people, at the same time, a lot of these people are supportive of the president of Russia, because as I said, his approval rate is in excess of 80%. Uh, but there is a, a substantial appetite for negotiations amongst the Russian people, according to this poll. Um, uh, you know, so the fact that I didn't see anti-war protests doesn't mean there aren't people in Russia that want to see negotiations. You know, almost half of the people, according to this poll, do want to see negotiations. Um, I, I'm sorry, there was second the second part of that question I, I forgot. There was more than just you know whether I saw an anti-war movement. Was there another part to that question? Um, yeah, so uh, is there much of an anti-war movement in Russia, and is there even political freedom for one? Uh, yeah, so I, I'm not going to, uh, as I said, there there are laws that do severely restrict speech in Russia. So, for example, there was a law that was adopted after the invasion. I've not read the law, so I'm not, you know, I'm, and I'm not a Russian lawyer, but as I understand it, and from speaking to Fred Weir and reading his articles about it, if you are, you could be subjected to criminal penalties if you are judged to have spread uh, lies about the war. And the one example that's been given is if you grossly exaggerate the number of Russian casualties. Um, so this is, you know, I, I'm very opposed to these kinds of laws. I have nothing good to say about them. You know, I'm a radical proponent of free speech. Uh, uh, I want to be very clear about that. But it's a tough environment in which to advocate uh, publicly. I don't think I don't, privately you can say these things, but if you start to organize a protest, you might get in trouble. Um, and but the other thing I wanted to answer, uh, which uh, I, 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 I think is a very important question, you talked about the possibility, the questioner of uh, Russia attacking other countries if we do a peace deal. Uh, of course, I, I have no crystal ball, you know, I, I can't read Vladimir Putin's mind. But I've seen absolutely no evidence, zero evidence, that the Russian government has any interest in extending this war into a NATO country. In fact, I am amazed that given the behavior of Poland in particular, how Poland, Poland has sent forces into Russia, uh, there are indications that active members of the Polish military are en engaged in combat. Uh, the primary means by which uh, heavy weapons are transited into Ukraine is through Poland. Poland is training Ukrainian soldiers. Uh, Poland is repairing damaged military equipment, taking it off the battlefield, returning it. Uh, and yet the Russians have never attacked a military facility in Poland. Uh, so why, if they're not going to do it now, when they're in the middle of the conflict, the Russians aren't going to attack Poland now. And Poland is playing such an important role in sustaining the Ukrainian war effort. The idea that, you know, after the war, the Russians are now going to attack a NATO member and bring upon themselves an even more formidable opponent than they currently confront, I just find that implausible. And I've not seen a single statement uh, from the Russian president or the Russian foreign minister to suggest that they have that intention, not before the invasion and not after the invasion. Okay, thank you, Dimitri. And what may be our last question for the night? Uh, one uh, we have one that's rather open ended. It's from James, and he says, uh, Dimitri, could you please talk a bit about the Ukraine crisis as part of the global transformation taking place today regarding BRICS expansion, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization expansion, and the new economic financial paradigm unfolding across Asia and the global south for a more just economic financial system? Great question. Uh, thanks for thanks for raising that subject because we haven't said nearly enough about it. Um, I'm going to quote to you excuse me, a statement that was made, I think, a week ago by the former uh, leader of South Africa, Jacob Zuma. And he rather diplomatically said uh, to the South African media, you know, there's a connection between this war and BRICS. And then cryptically, he said, but BRICS cannot be crushed. Uh, and he left it at that. <laughs> and, and so 
I think he was clearly implying that uh, BRICS members view this war as a means whereby the United States and its allies in the West uh, are not simply attempting to weaken Russia. They are attempting to break BRICS. BRICS, by the way, I believe by the measure of purchasing power parity, uh, which is a more reliable measure of GDP, in my opinion, uh, the nominal GDP, I, I believe it has a significantly larger collective GDP than uh, the G7. The BRICS is a very formidable force. Generally speaking, the countries there are growing faster than the major economies of the West. They have much larger population. They have control much larger territory. They control much larger natural resources than the West does. And the West is horrified by what is happening. There is a massive redistribution of economic power. And with economic power becomes, comes enhanced military and political power. And you're seeing the BRICS exercise that power. The BRICS, I think, uh, the Chinese, to the great chagrin of the Americans, I'm sure, managed somehow to bring the Iranians and the Saudis to the table together and effect a, a rapprochement, which is very good for the world. With whatever criticisms you could direct at the Iranian and Saudi regimes, and there's all kinds of things that we could say about them that are you know, extremely negative and totally justified, it still is nonetheless a good thing that they aren't going to be blowing each other up and destroying the Middle East in a war. Uh, and the Chinese did that. This is a real measure of the level of their political influence uh, in the world today. And all of this is being accompanied by, as you, the questioner mentioned, uh, a strong, a very concerted effort to uh, dethrone the US dollar as the global reserve currency. And that is a major, major threat to the American economy because the American economy is built on access to cheap credit. Because the US dollar is plays such an important role in the global economy, there's a very high demand globally for the dollar. There are a lot of people who want to get their hands on US dollars in the global economy. And because there's such a demand for the, the dollar, the US government can borrow money at rock bottom interest rates. If the demand for the US dollar falls because it no longer has the status of global reserve currency, the cost of credit to the United States is going to go up enormously. And the US already has a gigantic debt. So this is an existential threat to the US economy. And one thing is for damn sure, if the US you know, loses the ability to borrow massive amounts of money at rock bottom interest rates, um, it's not going to be able to fund the military industrial complex anymore. This massive war machine by which it extends its power throughout the world uh, will wither away and eventually die. So uh, nobody should have any illusions about what is going on here. This is about the era of U US hegemony coming to an end and the era of multipolarity in which non-Western countries play a much bigger role in the global economy and uh, geopolitics uh, has been born. And the question is, is the US government going to accept that? Or is it going to take us all down with it? That's where we're at. OK, well, thank you very much, Dimitri, for those powerful words and for your energy throughout this whole thing, which has been started at 8 o'clock officially, I think. So it's gone on for, for three whole hours. I'm glad our question period is so lively. We were able to get to most of them. Uh, I posted a couple that we didn't get to yet. Uh, but thank you all for those who asked questions. You made it very interesting for everyone. Um, what I'm going to do next is I'll transition us over to the closing. Uh, and by the way, I see some people clapping in the comments. Yes, thank you. If this was a, a Zoom meeting, I guess you could, you could we could ask people to show their their clap icon or whatever. But uh, but thank you. We do appreciate that. And I'm sure in, if it was a live meeting, he'd get a standing ovation like he did in Hamilton. So uh, thank you, uh, Dimitri. And I see the people in the comments there. Um, so I'm going to transition over to uh, John from Kingston Peace Council. John has been involved in some of the previous events or heavily involved in previous events, such as the, the one with Dan Kovalik and such. And he can tell you about uh, other aspects of the tour and fundraising and, and closing us out. So um, I'll go over to those gentlemen and, and to John now. So uh, thank you very much. Pardon me, so I did need to unmute there. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, just, you know, before we close out here uh, to let folks know, there will be some events coming up this weekend, uh, specifically uh, 
there will be uh, the Toronto Reprise Lecture. So that's going to be taking place July 8th at 1.30 at the Gwenlu Meeting Room uh, at the Northern District Branch of the Toronto Public Library. Uh, this is uh, 40 Orchard View Boulevard. Uh, not only that, there will be an anti-NATO protest in uh, Toronto at that time as well. Uh, let me see here. Now, I believe that that would be uh, this coming Sunday. I know Tamara Lorenz had uh, posted that in the chat here. Uh, and I guess just by way of uh, finishing things off here, Dimitri, I want to thank you for your courage to going to Russia and seeking out a peaceful solution to the war in Ukraine. And thank you for your determination in continuing your Canada-wide tour of peace to the very end, despite uh, all attempts to cancel it and deplatform you. And uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. This was uh, really great. And uh, read the Kanonovich brothers and uh, please follow our exploits further. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night.